Yeah, so thanks everyone for joining us. We've got a really exciting couple of months coming up with Water Stories. We're rolling out. Um, we've basically been incubating content for the last two years, even more than that now. And so we're releasing this whole series. We'll be releasing our water cycle animations, the full water cycle, the watershed death spiral, and the revived water cycle. We'll be releasing our shorts, Hope in a World of Crisis, Water, how it's the untapped solution to our climate crisis. And Water is Earth's Blood. And then we're going to be releasing two films that I'm really excited about. One about Walter Yenny and the Canberra National Botanical Gardens in Australia called Desert or Rainforest. Where they actually created a rainforest that wasn't a rainforest previously just by working with the natural cycles. Uh, and then we'll be releasing Reviving Rivers with Rajendra Singh which is really this amazing story in India where they've revived seven rivers, 250,000 wells, reduced the temperature two degrees Celsius. This will all be leading up to the launch of our core course, which is going to lead into our training platform to really train practitioners in watershed restoration, to train people like you on the ground, how to really make a meaningful difference for yourself, for your family, and also for your environment and for the climate at large. Um, so really excited about what we have coming up. I hope you all keep an eye out for that. The first stuff is going to start trickling out in February, and um, then it'll be over the next couple of months that we'll release this big bundle of content. And really excited for what Natalie has to share us, with us here today. And thanks, all everyone, for joining us here. I'll pass it back to Raleigh. Yeah, thanks, Zach. So here we are back with Water Stories, back with Sustainable Design Masterclass. It's really exciting to have Natalie uh, back on. We had a webinar with Neil Spackman and I with her about three years ago, and I was blown away by Natalie's on the ground experience and her just incredible stories showing people how to regenerate landscapes in areas where they had nothing and, and refugee camps and, and kind of the harshest areas of, of Africa and, and Yemen. And it was so inspirational seeing her ability to train people who live in the harshest area in the world, how to reclaim decency and basic livelihoods and how to go from an area of, of just scraping by and survival to actually getting their human rights met. And uh, Natalie Topa, she to me is a, she's a water hero. She's a water warrior. Like Rajendra Singh is a water man. Natalie po Topa is an epic water woman. And so this is so great hearing her, having her come on because she's had almost two decades of experience showing people how to use water retention, permaculture design, design and ecological methods to reclaim their basic livelihood needs and get from a place of survival and warfare to a place where they actually can start thinking about their needs as human beings. And these, these lessons that she's going to share, not just applicable to people in refugee situations, but they're applicable to anyone all over the world, whether you are fleeing an area of war or whether you're sitting on a few million dollars. It doesn't matter. These methods are what we need in a world where water is scarce, in a world where there's a crisis, because by healing our waterways, we bring peace back to the world and we bring peace back to people. So I'm really excited to to have Natalie on to share her journey and share her, her message and her methods about how she helps people restore water in their communities. Uh, and really quick, before we get started, I just remind folks, let me share the screen, that if you want to ask questions, we have a community here on uh, Circle. So uh, Cassie can post that link. Cassie's another awesome team member here at Water Stories. And uh, so we'll post that link. It's, you could, it's really quick to sign up. It takes like 20 seconds, but I'm gonna ask that people will get their questions answered first if they post on Circle. So you just go to that link, uh, community.waterstories.com. It'll be in the chat box and then you'll find this water restoration tab and then you'll be able to type your questions right here in the comment section. So any questions about that, just, just hit us up in the chat box. We'll send you the link. And officially, why don't we get this? Why don't we get this show on the road here? So, Natalie, <laughs> I'm. It's super ha awesome having you on, and this is going to be great having you share, share with folks. 
Great, thank you, Raleigh, Zach, and Cassie. Um, thanks a lot for the opportunity to do this. Uh, as you mentioned, we did a webinar some years ago, and the thing I love about um, you know the, the webinars that you do is that you'll allow enough time to kind of get do a deep dive into some of these things. Last night I uh, did a presentation, and I only had twelve minutes. So today I'm I'm taking time to not only tell the story of the work I've been doing, but a little bit about my own personal experience and how I came to do the work that I do. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And hopefully you can let me know when it's visible. And I don't have any questions or the chat room open because it was just a bit distracting. Yeah. Um, oh, and, and one quick reminder uh, for folks who want to ask questions, you know, ask them on circle. And we're going to wait until after Natalie's done presenting to open this up for questions. But, mm. but we can answer a few things in the background, like uh, Cassie, Zach, and I. But but like if you want to chat with Natalie, we'll wait till after the presentation stuff. Anyway. And also uh, for Raleigh and the team, if, if you feel like we need a bit of a break to just sort of punctuate the flow and open it up to questions, a couple of questions that are coming through, then I'm totally open to that. I'm just not going to have the chat room open. So my name is Natalie Topa. Um, thanks again to Raleigh, Zach, and Cassie for this opportunity. Um, I've been living here in East Africa for 17 years, um, but prior to that, I was working in the U.S. based in D.C., working on uh, urban planning, urban and regional planning with a focus on economic development, which is my background. Um, just before coming to East Africa, I was actually seconded to FEMA the year that they joined uh, Homeland Security, um, the year before Katrina. So we were in Florida with Hurricanes Francis, Charlie, Ivan, and Jean, category five, three, four, and I think two or three uh, respectively. And um, so that was sort of the work that I was doing before coming to South Sudan in 2005. So I came into South Sudan to work on post-war town planning and reconstruction. If you don't know much about South Sudan, um, it, is a, it was a giant country when, the two, when Sudan and South Sudan were one country. Um, but it's been plagued with conflict and war for going on 70 years now. Um, so this title slide was when I, I arrived to South Sudan and I was living in a tent on the Nile River and uh, there were no postcards <laughs> of Chuba, and my friends were always asking, you know, what is it like there? And so this was the first postcard from Juba, South Sudan, that I made in 2006 while living inside of one of those tiny tents in a mango forest on the Nile River. So I'm, I'm starting the story there because, um, as I mentioned, I came... Oops, what's happening? Oops. So I arrived to South Sudan, and immediately uh, the government, uh, I, I was seconded there to the Ministry of Infrastructure, uh, uh, Housing, Land and Public Utilities. So they put me in a plane with a bunch of South Sudanese engineers and off we went to visit different towns and things. But, um, and I was new, I wasn't sure if this was normal, but I was in a tiny little caravan uh, being flown by Russian pilots. And because we didn't have jet fuel available in this war zone, they removed some seats inside the plane and we carried our own jet fuel inside the aircraft. So they removed the seats, put in these barrel drums of, of jet fuel, which of course I was inhaling the fumes for the four hours or whatever it was that we were flying. And the thing was, is it was the rainy season. And if you know anything about um, South Sudan, remember when Forrest Gump was talking about the rain in Vietnam and he said, sometimes it even rains from bottom up. We get torrential rains in South Sudan. It was raining so hard and because of the turbulence, um, the, the drums were expanding and cracking, but we couldn't ascend above the cloud cover because of the pressure. So we had to just fly in this rainy clouds for hours until we reached different destinations. Uh, so that was my first introduction into South Sudan, which is a country that is full of water for half of the year, forest gump rains, and the other half of the year is full of swirling dust and dryness and drought and food insecurity. Um, and sued, the word sued, it actually means swamp. So 
Um, so this was my first intro into South Sudan. And then I, I'm not sure why my presentation isn't scrolling down, but um, this is the tent I was living in. Uh, you know, it's not a pop tent, but it's just a 12 gauge industrial vinyl, like low grade safari tent. And um, I lived in there for two years in this mango forest. I had two tortoises with me. It's like a kind of different type of cat lady. <laughs> they called me Mama Abugada, which means mother of the tortoises. So this was my life. Um, but as I moved around and started to see, you know, the country more and more and understand the, the complexity of issues. You know, we would go to towns and even urban areas were flooding, didn't have roads. Uh, so the picture on the left with this girl on the log, um, that's in South Sudan. And the man with the donkey cart is also in South Sudan. <coughs> you have to excuse me, I'm <coughs> recovering from COVID. <clears throat> so I'm coughing. Mm. But in the North picture, uh, the North picture, the, the upper right hand corner, that's in Khartoum, that's on the Nile River. And I just started to understand the story in this picture of the water related problems that the country and countries were having. They're now two separate countries that led, that underpinned in many cases, instability and conflict um, at different levels. So, you know, I just, uh, I was moving around and learning more about the context of this place and all of the struggles related to water. This is the con, you know, this is the same country, this is in South Sudan. And, you know, there may, some of the tribes are major, major cattle owners. And that's part of the story right now of the ongoing conflict that's there, um, our cattle raiding and competition over natural resources and water. Uh, so you can see how dry and brittle the landscape can be, even though much of it is in a swamp. And by the way, these photos are taken in the swampiest area, uh, area where the Nile River meets the Sobat River corridor. So believe it or not, this is black cotton soil. It's a flooded area during the rainy season. And then you can see how brittle it becomes during the dry season. So it's this dichotomy where half of the year people have food insecurity, water insecurity, and humanitarian aid is literally dropping food out of airplanes. So it started to be, I just started to be confused about how can we have so much water sometimes and no water at all. And every single year it's very cyclical. So um, I first came to South Sudan to work on post-war town planning and reconstruction, but then I joined another agency as country director and we were doing different types of programming, including infrastructure, <coughs> um, building schools, hospitals, and even doing things like road drainage. And I included this because <coughs> because we were trying to address the issue of too much water, but we were doing it the sort of the old conventional way of just trying to put a Band-Aid on the flooding and do drainages within the town. There I am with, my, with our team of engineers and, and everyone. Um, so, you know, I just was like, well, I started to realize that we're not addressing any root causes with this, but um, anyway, then I started to move outside of South Sudan. I became the regional representative for my same agency um, and moved to Nairobi and started moving around uh, throughout Africa and, and hearing more water stories from different people. And here I am with um, the grandmother of President Barack Obama. Her name is Mama Sarah. And Mama Sarah asked me to stay with her in the village and help her make more baby Obamas. Um, but that's just between us. Um, and then while I was with her visiting, I did visit Lake Victoria on the Kenya side. And it was just really heart wrenching to hear the stories of women who knowing full well that many of the fishermen are HIV positive, have to, they have the only thing that they have to exchange for fish so they can go and sell in the market is commercial sex, right? Um, transactional sex. So moms, mothers were going and having transactional sex, knowing full well that they are probably going to get HIV just so that they could buy food and also clean drinking water. They even would have sex with HIV positive water trucking drivers in exchange for clean water so they could give clean water to their kids. So just this story of water, water, water was just horrific. And it was the source or seemed to be, you know, at the root of so many different types of hardship and vulnerability. Um, in Liberia, if you, you go to Liberia, I'm sure today it's probably becoming so denuded, um, but massive old growth forests are coming after lorry after lorry after lorry filled. This one is not even very full. 
And this is something you see throughout West Africa, Central Africa, even in Southeast Asia, Myanmar is the worst I've seen, just huge, huge trees being trucked out all day, every day. And what happens is that infrastructure of the local landscape becomes denuded and it can't hold water. And so you start to have more and more extreme events and more you know, violent water behavior. It starts to impact the infrastructure and the trade corridors. And so that becomes this disaster domino effect. Um, Burundi, you know, Burundi is a country that used to be covered in old growth forest. Okay, <laughs> probably you can't tell by now, but if you see the smoothness of the hilltops, that's an indicator that water was passively flowing down the mountains because it had tree cover and a, you know, a thick perennial uh, vegetative buffer from, from you know, the, the jackhammering of raindrops. But look at how people have, are growing food. They're doing it, and this is, these are not even the worst pictures. In some places, so steep, and they're tilling and tilling every single year. Burundi gets forest gump rains, huge rains. You can't even hear yourself think when it's raining there, and you're in a, in a hut with a tin roof. It's so violently loud. So these massive rain events come, and these people are tilling on slopes like this, how long does it take before that soil washes away? So, you know, those Liberia, Burundi are places that are not water scarce. Um, but this is, this is Somalia. And, you know, just looking at how brittle this landscape is, you can see it's dry, there's nothing growing. And, you know, this is an important photo because many people talk about um, water scarcity in East Africa. And <clears throat> I don't know that we have water scarcity. We have huge rain events that come, water arrives, and then very quickly just flows right out of the system. So, you know, not to say that this was a jungle before, but it was thick bush. Keep in mind that Somalia used to be the largest exporter of bananas in the world in the 80s. Google it, it was a whole BBC documentary. So the landscape has changed. And as Alan Savory says, which I love, you know, it's not drought that causes bare ground, it's bare ground that causes drought. So this story really started to fill in. It's not only about water and hydrological cycles, it's also about soil, it's also about vegetation and biology. So I'll get into that. Um, when I visited Yemen in 2019, uh, I, we went 1500 kilometers from the north, from the south into, from the north into the south, into the Houthi um, held territories and passed through, you know, more than 100 checkpoints and <laughs> was fully covered and uh, was sort of undercover at that time, if I can share that. But these are the kinds of images that I saw. Uh, you know, these are bridges that have been blown out. Now, why is Saudi Arabia funded by US uh, blowing out bridges in Yemen. It's to cripple the society economically. These are trade corridors. These are commercial routes that have been blown up by airstrikes. And I also just want to recognize that Yemen had very horrific airstrikes this week and uh, close to 2,000 people have been, have been assassinated, murdered. Um, so just wanted to recognize that. Um, then moving into Ethiopia, I saw roads, market access roads, <clears throat> which are trade, trade routes as well, commercial corridors, <clears throat> but they're also being destroyed. Who is destroying this infrastructure? Ethiopia at this time was not at war. There's a conflict now with the Tigray region, but it is the extreme water behavior, the violence of the, of the hydrology that has shifted that is causing this destruction. And if you look around, I mean, you'll see trees and ask, well, why are the trees not absorbing all this water? Do you know what kind of trees these are? These are eucalyptus trees that are allopathic, that can preclude you know, different forms of soil life and can definitely impact soil structure. And so the whole entirety of you know, the Ethiopian landscape is being replaced with a monoculture of trees that are not indigenous and that do not help to keep the soil life in place. And <clears throat> again, you have this disaster domino effect that is very destructive to economic infrastructure. I mention economic because for donors and people and governments, that is what matters. Not necessarily for me, but it is a very underpinning, you know, a big issue. So, I mean, there are other issues is what my point is. <laughs> There's human suffering, poverty, you know, famine, those are also really big issues to pay attention to this, not just the economics. 
This is a graphic that I generated when I was working in um, the Somali region of Kenya. And the reason I, you don't have to go through this, I'm not gonna explain the entire graphic. What I'm trying to show here is the interconnectedness of the social, economic, ecological impacts of these, you know, of ecological degradation and climate change. So why I say ecological degradation and climate change, because I don't personally believe that all the drought and disasters and extreme water events we are having in East Africa are due to climate change. Yes, we have increase uh, in water volumes in some cases, but right now here in East Africa, what's happening is that we are getting water either too much or too little, too early or too late. But what happens to that water when it hits the ground and the way that it starts to move and that behavior on the surface is because of ecological degradation. The lack of vegetative layer, the humectic layer, the necrosphere that gets you know, blown away, uh, which I'll show you in a minute. So here in this, um, in this graphic, a shock happens. Traditional livelihoods are less viable. People have to move into new places that can lead to more conflict. It's a governance issue. The government doesn't know how to handle it. People you know, are looking for money and survival and basic coping mechanisms. They go out, they exploit the natural environment. They harvest bush products like stone for aggregate and river sand and twigs and trees for charcoal. Uh, men start raping and brutalizing women and girls. So the whole gender issue becomes really pronounced. Um, and so, you know, it is such a systemic impact and, uh, and under, you know, underneath all of this is the issue of water and the stability and water and soil and the stability of those to be able to support human life, animal life, social systems, economic systems. So, okay, resilience. You know, what, what does it mean to resile? To resile is to bounce back and, and to, you know, regain a, a healthy status after an impact or a shock or a stress. But resilience of whom or what? Raleigh mentioned that I work in the context of forced displacement. Um, I'm a child of refugees. My family are from Eastern Europe, from Poland and Uganda. Uh, they were registered with UNHCR, relocated in, in the US and in Brazil. So I, I identify as Polish American, um, but the point is my family were immigrants. I grew up as a third country child in the US as a first generation American. Humans move, that's what we do. We have legs, we're mobile um, and that's okay. Um, and people move for different reasons. Mixed migration can be about economics, about education, about conflict, about all kinds of things. Um, so what are we talking about when we talk about resilience? Resilience of whom? It can be of people, for sure, and we do care about that. Oh, and I forgot to mention, forced displacement refers to refugees, people who have left their country. Um, IDPs, internally displaced people who have not left their country, but who have um, remained within. Uh, and returnees, which are people who are coming back after displacement. And of course, the host community, which some people don't like that term because it not, is not necessarily like the choice of a hosting community to host. They don't walk around with like trays of welcome, you know, welcome drinks. So they can definitely also be very, very impacted. Um, they already are extremely resource scarce. They don't have basic needs met and social services and things like that. And now suddenly 30,000 or 100,000 people show up in their backyard, that can cause conflict. And so we always want to address all people that we call them displacement affected communities. Um, so people who are impacted regardless of you know, the angle in which they're coming into this. So re resilience of whom or what? Of people, of crops, of the local ecology. It can be of animals, including wild animals or domestic livestock. Entire farms, right, need to be resilient. Um, the soil needs to be resilient. Roads should be resilient. Markets, shelters, namely displacement shelters is what I'm referring to. Entire watersheds need to be resilient. Um, communities as a whole and women and girls. But resilient from what? Like, what is the risk to them? Well, it can be flood. It can be dropped. It can be market disruptions, which we saw massively during COVID. And as I always say, you know, food security is not, cannot, should not be a function of the market because Raleigh, <laughs> your stomach doesn't give a hoot about markets. Your stomach wants to eat and markets fail, your stomach doesn't fail. So how do we buffer and make resilient to market disruption, disruption you know, food systems, families, 
So uh, resilient from food insecurity, energy insecurity, seed insecurity. That's a big one. Anyone who knows me. I've gone three times to India to study with Dr. Vandana Shiva. I'm very aware of you know, the corporate um, agenda to control food through seeds. Let me just stop there. <laughs> um, so also extreme conditions or events, climate change and ecological degradation, as well as social instability and predation, rape, violence, brutality from men and boys to women and girls. And if I'm a little harsh, if it's if that's not, if this is the first time, first time you've heard uh, such a strong statement about men versus women, it's because I'm sick of listening to passive language. We talk about sexual and gender-based violence or violence against women. I'm done with that. It's men usually doing the violence. So I'm shifting the focus to emphasize the predator and not the victim. Um, okay, so the tools that we have for designing resilient spaces and landscapes are three main ones. And by the way, um, I didn't want to make a little bit of a plug because I am taking this course with Javin that um, I hope Rally and Zach, you might mention towards the end uh, on low tech erosion control. Um, and so this is, you know, this is the direction that I've really been moving into, but I'm trying to continue to build my skills and capacity. So I'm taking this course with them. And when we talk about low tech erosion control, I haven't started the course yet, but this is from the work that I've been doing is you know, the tools we have or what we're trying to affect are soil, water, and plants, or in other words, geology, hydrology, and biology. So soil and geology, earthworks to help plant the rain in degraded landscapes, generating structures that boost living systems such as earthworks and stoneworks. Um, every design is completely site specific. There is no rule of thumb. There is no uh, you know, copy and paste model. Um, so when we do the earthworks and try to manage the soil and do citizen engineering, what we're doing is affecting water and hydrology. So we want to save water in well-structured soils for drier times, extending the seasonality and doing water banking. Um, we want to mitigate flooding, we want to protect from drought, we want to create microclimates, and we want to recharge groundwater systems. I'll get into those things later. Plants, you can't do the soil and the water without the biology, right? You can't do a big swale and not seed it, because the first rain that will come will immediately start to erode and melt away that structure. Um, you know, if it's a big rain like we have here, and of course, depending on the soil. So <clears throat> we need those root systems to start to come in and stitch together <clears throat> and weave together the structure and the stability of our earthworks. So that by the time the water comes, um, they'll be less susceptible to damage and destruction and all that. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, one second. Mm. What I added was spaces and built structures. Because a lot of times we're doing water uh, harvesting work in physical built spaces and with infrastructure, whether that's roads or it's a concrete compound. When I say compound, I mean, I don't know what you say in English, like an office complex. In, in, the, in the field, we have a compound, which is usually a walled compound of our offices. So walls, rooftops, impervious services, hardscape surfaces. Um, they really impact the behavior of water. So you can't ignore those roads, footpaths, rooftops, all those things, even the walls, even walls and heat retaining surfaces. Okay, so these are this is the toolbox. Um, and we're doing this at different scales. Uh, when I say we, I mean the work that I've been leading in different agencies and um, and different projects that I've been involved in across East Africa and beyond also Southeast Asia. So, you know, starting from very, very tiny scale, um, which I should have included Raleigh and Zach and Cassie, my um, apartment, you know, I live in an in a urban area in an apartment in Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, I also do all kinds of things in my apartment to practice permaculture ethics, uh, from composting to beekeeping, cheese making, sprouting, spirulina, beekeeping, um, mushrooms, vermicompost, micro livestock, mealworms, black soldier fly larvae, crickets, lots of stuff. So that, that's a, another scale that belongs lower. <laughs> but around refugee shelters, right? And a shelter could be a tarp with sticks that's baking hot in Somalia. 
So, you know, let's let's protect it from flooding. Let's let's cover the let's shade it from the west sun. Um, looking now to the next level, homesteads and our office compounds, sort of the area around the home, the larger area and the environs, and how do we create a sponge? And when I say sponge, I mean how do we increase the absorptive capacity to pacify water behavior and store and bank that water deep into the soils, covered and protected with cover crops and shaded trees and things um, so that we can extend the season. Then looking at the whole village, okay? What is a village? It can be an urban space, an urban village, a refugee camp or settlement. Those are different, I won't go into it, but they're different, but lots of people together closely with lots of nutrient <laughs> and waste for recovery potential. And then of course, looking at the landscape. So subcatchment, micro watersheds, how do we spongify the whole watershed with trees and water harvesting structures and things like that. Oops, uh-oh, why is it asking me to force quit? Uh-oh, that's not gonna be a problem. Okay, so trees can resolve a lot of this, but we cannot talk about trees without water and soil. Should I, Raleigh, should I just go ahead and stop the PowerPoint or is it gonna? The, you could to... like the like there's some background tasks that you can shut down so if you go that for if that force window when force quit window shows up again you can quick uh quit out of some of the other non-running applications like you could probably quit out of google chrome and just leave powerpoint and zoom up okay well if that come, happens again i'll i'll look for your guidance <laughs> First, quick coaching okay so trees meet so many of our needs right if anyone has studied permaculture Am I speaking quickly, by the way, Raleigh, and everyone? Or are you reading me well? I'm reading pretty well. I think you're coming, coming through there? great. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think everyone's you? loving it so far. OK, great. I've not seen any comments, but hopefully they're not complaining. So food, fodder, fuel. I normally say food, fodder, fiber, fuel, fertility, and pharmaceuticals with an F. You can extend that to like flowers and finance and many other things. but. You know, food, human food for our sustenance. We can get that through trees, fodder. And when I say fodder, I'm not only talking about ruminants and livestock, I'm also talking about pollinator fodder. You know, those flying around people, they need fodder, they need food. So uh, flowering trees, flowering perennials. Perennial stability is the name of the game here. Fuel, when I say fuel, we can talk about sticks and twigs for rocket stoves with convection heat made out of cob. We can talk about pyrolysis and charcoalization of wood fuel. We can talk about leaves and biomass for methane production through biogas. There are a lot of different ways to derive fuel from perennial biomass, but that's one of the many ones that we need when we talk about energy security. And by the way, in the context of forest displacement, energy security can be a major driver of conflict between community members and community you know, displaced community and host community, because suddenly 10,000 people come, they're chopping down your trees so they can cook goat meat, can be problematic. Fiber, fiber, uh, I'm not talking about <laughs> uh, for biogas generation. <laughs> um, I'm talking about for construction, for clothing, for materials, your pulp, for paper products, for um, whatever, crafts, furnitures, furnishings, dishes, we rely, we are tree people, okay? Our planet is a tree planet and as a forest planet and we are forest people who need all of these forest things. Fertility, that can be for uh, nitrogenous trees for building fertility in the soil, but not only nitrogen. And I kind of feel like we often are a little nitrogen obsessed. There are other, um, there are other uh, elements of fertility that we get from trees forget about not just the soil organic carbon that we get from falling leaf matter and all of that, but I'm talking about the actual chemical interactions in the soil with different types of trees. One, for example, is the Balanites, uh, which can increase your yields if you're doing grain crops in a um, alley cropping, blah, blah, blah. So um, trees help to build and protect soil structure, okay? Their root systems help to tie it all together. They keep dropping leaves all day long. The soil, the soil is a big stomach. It needs to eat all day long. There's little people in there, engineers, they need food. And I know I'm oversimplifying things, Raleigh and team, but I know there are some people who are not um, as conversant, uh, maybe in the audience, so I wanted to break this all down. So trees are, trees, their roots, they're, you know, physically, mechanically, chemically, 
are providing soil structure and stability. And when we start to remove the trees from the landscape, then the soil dies and it becomes dirt, right? Soil is alive, dirt is dead. <coughs> And it can start swirling around. When we used to have, you know, dirt devils, dust devils in the landscape, they're now becoming small tornadoes here in East Africa. And when you talk about <coughs> disasters from climate change, it's not only flood and drought, okay? It's fire because these wind gusts, you remember what happened in Boulder last month? These wind gusts are ripping through the landscapes, burning people's assets. Um, the wind is blowing the roofs off, their, off of their houses. It's tearing away their soil, their fertile topsoil. So it's on the move. It's going away. And what people neglect to talk about is that soil erosion, soil loss is really the number one biggest environmental problem that we have on our living planet. And after that is biodiversity loss, pollution. But we still struggle as humans um, to sort of think systemically about the entire living system. So what happens then is that, you know, the water, okay, in a, in a healthy, thick living forest, like where Raleigh lives in, you know, Oregon, where you have these big giant forests, a huge rainfall can come and up to 90% of that water will never leave the forest. It just soaks right into that giant spongy forest floor. When you remove all of those trees, that water has nowhere to go except away, right? that magical place called away, like when we throw things away. Um, and so it joins with other, with its other little water buddies and they become big flood events. And this continues to rip off fertile topsoils and cause major destruction and eat, you know, eat viable arable lands. Um, so I'm forcing quitting calendar. Yep, first quit. I'm forcing quitting Chrome. Yeah, Google Chrome. Not Zoom. Yeah, keep Zoom and PowerPoint open. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay, so, you know, so we start to have massive erosion. We have start to have massive loss of water and nutrient out of the system. So the viability for that system, that ecology to return becomes less and less, and it definitely becomes less able to, you know, um, provide for life, human and animal. I talked early about geology, hydrology, biology, soil, water, and plants is the name of the game, okay? So, <laughs> Rally, I told you before we had our little prep call, um, you know, bald men are okay, bald mountains are not, okay? <laughs> so if you're a man with a bald head, you're great. If you're a mountain with a bald head, we need to like immediately address this. We need to have, we need to talk. Um, so this, uh, in this situation, what happens is when all the landscape has been so totally denuded, the absorptive capacity is stripped away and then water just starts to trickle down and, and create erosion scars and patterns that get deeper and deeper and more violent. And so what we want to do is <clears throat> take that water, which is fast, incisive and destructive, <clears throat> slow it down, right? We want to pull that destructive energy out of it by redistributing that water across the landscape, slowing it down, calm down, spread and sink into the soil and save it and store it for as long as we can with a bunch of other layered methods, cover crops, trees, microclimate, mulches, all those kind of things. So there are a lot of strategies for earthworks and stoneworks. And I, uh, the work that I lead is either labor intensive handworks, um, you know, uh, labor based earthworks. So humans digging or machine based um, earthworks, which is, you know, we use bulldozers. Usually I prefer excavators. I worked very closely with Warren Brush, by the way. Um, and, you know, I, I'm partial to excavators, but we use bulldozers, excavators, graders, dump trucks, you name it. Um, so there are different types of strategies that you can use in a landscape to harvest water. Terracing might be one. That's a lot of what happens in places like Yemen, Southeast Asia, where you have very steep slopes. Key line design is another one, which um, in East Africa, we don't see a lot of. I know some people have, um, have, the, have the diggers, but um, bioswales on contour, gully plugging with stoneworks, with uh, stickworks, with all of, so there's a lot of different ways that you can 
you know, create a prison for water so it doesn't move. Uh, and it's better to not strong arm nature. You don't want to come into a giant one big thing. Do a lots of teeny tiny little things, okay, starting from the top all the way down. So when we start to bank that moisture and water deep into the soils, we start to have this biological uplift. We no longer have bald mountains. We really want to make sure that we have very properly treated mountain tops, ridge tops, hilltops, so that that water, as soon as it falls, can already be, you know, have sort of a shock absorber. <coughs> okay, <clears throat> so when working with communities, you know, one of the most exciting things that I just love doing is when we do sort of a resource review, okay, <coughs> to look at all the things that that people already have, right? One thing I can't stand about the humanitarian sector um, and emergency sector and development in general um, is that we, it, we create a lot of dependency and this perceived notion that, you know, nothing that we have is good or right or valuable and we, you know, our life sucks, we're in misery and poverty and we must rely on outside people, agencies, you know, to provide something. So, um, you know, we, it's the global north has created that uh, by and large um, because we, you know we give a lot of handouts and don't address root causes so it's really exciting to come in and and change that narrative a bit and ask questions i'm not an expert in these contexts i don't know anything about them i don't know what it takes to walk you know for six months from a place in South Sudan to a Ugandan refugee camp and all the, the insanity that you have to go through in that process. I'm not an expert in that, but other people are. You have to listen, eyes open, mouth shut, and understand people's traditional knowledge, their indigenous wisdom, the ancient innovation that they come with, all that experiential capital, okay? So, um, in this case, you know, I love when we when we have a mixed group with host community and people who have um, been displaced and are settled in that community, at least temporarily, because there's all often a very rich exchange. Women will say, oh, we use this for baby stomach digestive problems. They're like, oh, well, we use this for cow eye problems. Like this woman on the right um, in the blue, she has a, she had this cactus and she said, um, this cactus is very useful. If you squeeze it and you get the juice, if you have some blemishes on your skin, it's really good like for acne or any irritation. But if you're having problems with hyenas disturbing your livestock at night, you can dip it in blood and throw it to the hyenas and it will kill the hyenas. So we love multi-purpose, um, multi-use things. So here we're working with a community. We set them out and ask them to collect resources. And they come back with seeds and beans and ethnobotanical treasures of herbs and medicinals and I don't know it's always an amazing learning exchange when we do this but the point is there is a wealth of resources available available locally and likewise with soil building right um many NGOs and donors which I find highly unethical uh promote chemical farming right there's a big machinery in our planet uh, driven by you know capitalist ideals we have a fossil fuel industry we have a defense industry that you know we have all of these violent economies that also produce chemicals for farming um and those chemicals you know and they are accompanied by gmo seeds so you give people gmos and you say here's this awful chemical that you need to use with this seed that's not how our planet works no, like we don't need poisons to create life-giving foods, period. I'm not gonna go into that, but hopefully people are really clear on how I feel about this. It is unethical for donors, UN agencies, you know, certain corporations that I won't name, but hopefully we know some of the ones we're talking about to come to poor people, give them seeds that re do not regenerate again and again and again, and poisons to kill their soil. I want to remind everyone that the word human comes from the word humus, right? Not that great uh, thing that we eat from Lebanon, um, but humus, the humectic layer of rich organic uh, organism rich um, soils. So all of these materials are available, whether it's nitrogen, whether it's carbon, we mix all of those things into the soil to create fertility and sponge water holding, you know, water absorbing and holding spongy carbon and all of those things. So we do these double dug beds, which I'll get into in a minute. And then we want to, um, we want people to understand how to use 
local survey tools made with local materials. You can use bunyip levels, water levels. I have a laser level here in, in my house. Um, but the most obvious one and easy and kind of democratic one that anyone can access are just basic A-frames, right? So it's an A-frame, we show everyone how to calibrate it, uh, and we use that to measure the natural contours and natural patterns of the land. If I can just say, I mean, in the whole permaculture movement, um, oftentimes I see mandala gardens and weird, you know, cool shapes, um, but why are we imposing an artificial pattern onto the landscape when our job should be to extract the existing pattern and use that to inform our design so that we can possibly harvest all of those natural flows and influences comprised of water and nutrient. So please don't do mandala gardens. Um, or if you are, then don't teach other people that and say it's permaculture. <laughs> mm. Um, so I love sacred geometry, you know, like if that's what your lesson is, then do that. Um, okay, so design, um, really basically, you know, this is Regina's house. Regina lives in dry land, Kenya. Um, she's a Turkana woman. They're very, very dry there. But when water came, her house would get flooded. So here's Regina's house. And what's going on with Regina's house? Where, where does the sun set? That sun is super intense and... Um, of the, you know, the West sun of the sunset. There's a saying in Somali, you know, um, in Somali culture, sometimes a husband will have multiple wives and the children of the wife, <laughs> of one wife may say, the evening sun is like your non-parental mother. They have no mercy. Um, so the West sun is super hot <clears throat> and can kill crops. It can make your house hot, your kitchen hot. If you live in, you know, in this African context where your kitchen is like a tiny structure outside baking in the sun. So where's the water coming from? Where is it pooling and causing flooding? Regina's house was getting a lot of flooding. Where's the shade? We have to be shade hunters, okay? When I arrived to a site, I asked the teams, where, where's the shade? Be a shade hunter. Because that's the enabling environment for little delicate, fragile beginnings of your system. Where's the gray water going? That is a major resource. So with this information, we made this little design and we captured the water that was flooding Regina. She was an old, old widow, and but she would get water inside her house up to her mid thigh. So by creating a bioswale on contour behind her house, and you can see that we've got stones here for a little place where she can walk up and put her gray water for this banana. You can see that banana. And now this water is still going to continue its path downhill, but we just want that to happen under the soil where it can take a year, not on top of the soil where it can take one second to reach six meters away in a major flood event. So you can see the bioswale soaks water and it's gonna keep going down, down, down. It's gonna saturate these beds, which are also 60 to 80 centimeters deep. And then we fence the whole thing. So we're mitigating flood, we're mitigating drought and, and it's by design, okay? So this is another view. Um, and so this is the bioswale. People might ask, gee whiz, why are there, why are you using stones as mulch inside the bioswale? Because that's all we have. We do like to mulch inside of our swales for extra water retention. If you don't have mulch, if you don't have crop debris or dry grass or dry leaves, use rocks, because that's what's there. In Algeria, <coughs> you know, this is how they build their houses. And I was working with a team there. And the first thing I wanted them to understand is like, this is how they build their houses. They have a, a, a brick home with a brick compound wall and it's all baking in the sun. It's basically a giant oven. So immediately shade hunters, where's the shade? Ne you know, this is the West sun. So we've got shady area next to the wall behind the house. How can we capitalize on those? How do we optimize that opportunity to start to bring in shade trees because the likelihood of their survival will be higher and, you know, and try to use those spaces um, in, a, in a design. So, you know, this is how we can convert. We've got water harvesting swale and a little perma garden with double dug beds. You know, you might put a goat or a seating area or outdoor living space. For some of the refugee shelters, you know, I've had women complain they don't, their shelter is not big enough. They have seven children, they're a widow. And what they're saying is not necessarily my house is not big enough, but I don't have enough livable space for my family. So we always try to extend that out away from the shelter, creating shade either with vegetation or recovered resources and materials, the old torn tarp. But you know, this is getting more into the placemaking. 
elements uh, and, and climate resilience. If you're in this house, you are very hot. And if you're an old woman who has COVID, you don't want to be in this house. You also don't want to be in this house, but this house is, I mean, because you don't want COVID <laughs> um, and be have a hot fever, but this is going to be way more pleasant with cooler temperatures. So speaking of COVID, um, I made this graphic for our teams when COVID hit because as uh, you know, being in the humanitarian sector, NGOs were just doing water basins and hand washing points everywhere. And I thought, is the legacy of this going to be more mosquitoes and malaria? Because you dump that basin out and you just create a honeymoon suite for mosquitoes. Or can we take that water and create a mulch basin, a banana circle, you know, dig a hole, fill it with mulch, plant it with a little micro food forest, you know, whatever, but get the water from destruction to production, you know, stop the public health risk of that water and get it into a situation where the mulch and the fungi and mycelial network can clean that water, filter it and feed, uh, you know, with moisture and nutrient surrounding plants. Um, this is something I see all the time in um, all over the world. Uh, so in the humanitarian sector, especially with wash programming, water sanitation and hygiene, um, you know, we have tanks. And in Africa, almost all the tanks are black. In Yemen and Middle East, you'll see more white tanks. But on the situation on the left is the legacy of water tanks in East Africa. You have a black tank on a big, on a high, um, you know, tower, baking in the sun, dripping, leaking, having seepages that collect, and it just becomes some Disneyland of disease. It becomes a mosquito honeymoon suite. Why? Let's change that story. Dig a hole, fill it with mulch, plant it, plant something to block that hot afternoon sun, paint your thing white, cover it with water, I mean, with vines and perennials. So, this is not an expensive thing, okay? It's a solute, tiny micro solutions through micro design opportunities. And really the, you know, the challenge of scaling these things up is to get people to think like designers and be citizen engineers. I'm sure that question is gonna come up. Someone will ask, well, what is, you know, is this scalable? Okay, so I talked about double dug beds. So these, um, I led a training in South Sudan in, uh, November, and we did a little sponge farm. I don't know if it was a garden or a farm. It was kind of a farden. So uh, we did these double dug beds, but this is like dissected, so you can really see the guts of it. So we dug down deep. We measure the bottom using an A-frame, so that whole thing should be level on the bottom, so water will spread evenly when it comes. And this is a bioswale on contour above it. The beds are on contour. But look at how much stuff we filled in there. Carbon, nitrogen, leaves, sticks, twigs, food waste. You can put a dead chicken in there. Put a dead mouse in there. Put, I mean, don't, I don't want to list all the dead things you can put in that. But, you know, you know, it, this is, should be a biological hub that breaks down, holds water, and basically becomes a water storage tank with a garden on top. Um, so taking that concept, even in, even in Somalia, with the tiniest spaces, having little nano, you know, food space systems, um, this, you know, women moms now are digging down, they're filling the beds, and they're finding the shadiest place around the shelter to do that. And even if it's just one single bed, you can see that, you know, planted with some different greens and different types of things, <coughs> they're at least able to add micronutrients to their <clears throat> to their food. Is it going to meet all their food needs? Maybe not. Is it going to at least contribute dark, rich, leafy greens, which do not exist at all in this town? Heck yeah. You know, don't forget, refugees are not receiving like these five, you know, star Michelin meals that are well balanced. No, they get WFP wheat from the United States grown with fossil fuels and fake seeds and all kinds of corporate chemical garbage. Um, they and they get palm oil from <laughs> from Indonesia that's destroying peatlands. So anyway, they're not micronutrient rich foods, and that's what we need to supplement. And this is how people are doing it independently using tiny little design um, mechanisms. 
Here's another example. I mean, it doesn't get smaller. It doesn't get more accessible than this, right? This anybody can do this. So this mama here, she has a hole, did, filling it with a bunch of stuff. We do it on contours so that water hopefully can at least passively enter. And we never step and compact on that. It stays fluffy so water can enter. And for five years, you don't have to dig that thing again. And it has so much fertility inside, you can plant super, super intensively. Um, because plants are not competing with each other. They just go straight down to, to access their nutrient and water. Um, this is Martha. She's a Dinka from South Sudan. And I know where she comes from. Um, you know, where she comes from is such black cotton soil. It's like driving on oil. <laughs> it's clay, pure clay. Um, and of course, you know, refugees are not like Donald Trump. They get prime real estate. They get the most undesirable land that a, a host country you know, might be willing to offer. So in this case, um, that was very rocky soil. And she said to me, Natalina, that's what they call me in South Sudan. She said, Natalina, I don't know how to grow food in rocks. I said, let's show you. And let's show you how that those rocks can become an asset. So we created a wonderful little tiny perma garden just outside her house using water harvesting tiny little swale using those stones as stoneworks to harvest water and nutrient to protect it you know using stones as a mulch using stones as a silt trap now one rainy season later this is what martha's garden looked like so we integrated perennials. These were perennial beans that I brought from uh, from Somali refugees in Kenya. This is in this is in Uganda. She's in Uganda. We brought in bananas. We brought in passion fruit that covered the whole entire tree. So in this photo, like we entered inside, and then she's standing here inside next to this banana um, with one of our yeah. So you know. It just became a jungle of food. It is so diverse and so and there's so much biomass. She can just keep chopping and dropping and continuing to feed the soil. The soil is a stomach. Feed it all day, every day. Okay, so um, not you know, I think that agencies that deal with displacement affected populations should also imbibe those principles um, and you know do you know basically internalize the ethics of what we're trying to do to support people in their resilience and adopt those in our own operations. So if I think, you know, NGOs who have field offices, our compounds, our office compounds, all should be designed for regenerative resilience. So this, in this particular compound, this was a compound, uh, an NGO office compound in Uganda, uh, sorry, Tanzania. Um, this is not to scale. <laughs> um, you, we had buildings, we had trees and vegetation, but what would happen is water would enter inside the compound um, and it was creating so much structural pressure on this internal wall. It's quite a steep hill, right? This is the top uphill and going downhill as clearly indicated by these arrows for people who are not familiar with gravity. Um, and so this wall was getting a shock. These are shock stars uh, because all this water was collecting. The landlord was desperate. He'd brought in engineers and contractors and they could not crack this nut. So Warren Brush and I came here. We conducted a training. The water now, instead of just busting that wall, we spread it out, distributed it across the small space and the existing trees, we retrofitted with little water harvesting, what I call smile burns. Um, you can call them half moons or medialunas or whatever you want. Uh, and we did double dug beds. So we just try to create all these sponge, sponge, sponge pockets, pockets of water retention in the space. So this is where the, this is the gate. That's the guard house. This is the gate where the water was entering and you know, going on down to that wall. So what we did is now we created a bioswale on contour. We covered it with a trellis and you're gonna see trellises in this presentation. Why trellis? Gardens, farms, just like forests and natural systems should be vertical and three dimensional, right? If you think of like, I'm not a religious person, but the Garden of Eden, I don't think it was like a monocrop farm that gets harvested and is just a brown brittle field you know, for half of the year. So it should be vertical. It should have perennial stability. It should have verticality and lots of cool dimensions uh, to create microclimate and shade and coolness. So um, if you don't have trees or while you're waiting for your trees to grow, add a trellis. Um, so we have this trellis, we have a tiny little footbridge and now that water is spreading out. 
And it's spreading in this direction where you can see the berm. By the way, swales don't have to have berms. Um, I know that that's <laughs> permanent all over the world or like jaws dropping, but um, you can have which is called a level cell, like a sheet flow, right? So if you remove the berm, then you don't have to concentrate the exit point at one spillway and it can just evenly sheet flow out of the berm across an entire landscape. So pro tip. So here it is, it's all spread out. And then this is what it looked like. I think this is about four or five days later. Um, so now our, you know, I mean, the office compound has a, a lovely garden. It's going to fill in and grow. It's a demonstration site for donors and partners. It can be a learning site for your own staff and technical staff. And then around each tree and stuff, we retrofitted with, um, you know, other water harvesting like mulch basins and stuff, as I mentioned. So in another compound, um, this was a really big compound, NGO compound in uh, Dadaab, which is the Somali part of northeastern Kenya. And, or from your perspective, northeastern, that side. So buildings, lots of trees. And then what happens is because there's so much hardscape, you know, impervious surfaces that don't absorb water, um, the water runs off of the rooftops and all of the hardscape surfaces, including, you know, one thing in East Africa and Africa and in places around the world, you have people who sweep, sweep, sweep all day long, usually women, uh, because of <laughs> hashtag patriarchy, um, but it's often women, mostly women who are going to be sweeping the compound to keep it clean. And there are reasons that people do that, snakes, insects, that kind of stuff. So they take that organic material, burn it often or throw it away and view it as a waste. Um, so anyway, you so what, you, what happens is when you're sweeping the compound all the time, the soil is becoming more and more compacted. There's no soil life to fluff it up and, you know, dig it. Um, and soften it and so it all all the water just collects into the sump and floods so what uh, i did is first we came in and did a massive chop and drop on all of the name trees and we used that that not that we chopped the trees down we gave them a big haircut okay um, so we gave a big haircut to the understory of all the trees. The first thing within an hour, everyone was like, oh my God, it's so much cooler in the compound because the wind breeze is blowing through. And we took that uh, material and I created what I call green islands, like spongy islands around the buildings. So we now have <coughs> so many like, parking lots of that water. You know, here the water is moving like in highways. <laughs> we don't want highways of water, we want parking lots. Um, so this is what I'm referring to, like here they sweep, sweep, sweep. When water comes off of this roof, it pools here and starts to meander towards the sump. And so what I did is where we had these islands, we just broke them up and dug deep. We, <laughs> the team, it was actually, you know, around my birthday and the team, like I got almost eight tons of goat manure. It was really sweet. Um, they brought in, you know, all this goat manure and where the, these islands didn't exist, we came in with new stones and we made them around all the buildings. So now when that water comes off of the roof, like you may not be able to afford gutters and, you know, rainwater harvesting for domestic use stored in the soil. So now that water will roll off the roof. And because we've created this thick sponge with all the chop and drop biomass from the neem trees, plus manure, plus, I don't even remember, lots of stuff, sawdust. So this is what I mean by these kind of green islands around every building. Also, this compound had 50 ACs. I put uh, buckets under a number of them and averaged that in a 24 hour period, on average, these buckets are collecting 7.5 liters of water. Maybe somebody can translate for Americans what that is. Um, I don't know what that is in American, but uh, the, you know, the buckets are harvesting the water and normally that just evaporates. It's allowed to just evaporate. And let me pause here for one second because this is clean water. <laughs> it's just from evapotranspiration from the ACs. It's not alkaline from the ground, which is super salted in this region uh, in Dada. Um, and so what I did is we, with the team and our engineers, we just cut all those pipes and added a hose pipe here, Andrew, the engineer, was putting this hose pipe that goes down here into a banana circle. And the sweeping from the compound, this had just been swept. And normally, they burn this or throw it away. That now goes into this mulch pit. We've planted bananas and all these things. So um, on that 
on that uh, issue of the wastewater, I also want to mention in Dadaab refugee camp, you have about 200,000 people of prayer age, primarily Muslim, and there are other nationalities in Dadaab refugee camp, but let me just talk about the Somali population. 200,000 people, okay, of prayer age, seven years or older, every day using up to five liters of water, you know, every, every time you're, uh, washing for ablution for prayers you're washing with water and that happens up to five times a day and that can be five liters of water in one day Two hundred thousand people times five liters a day is one million liters of water in a single day that translates to 30 million liters of water hey unhcr if you're out there 30 million liters of water in a month there is no reason that dadab refugee camp isn't a thick thriving vital food forest where the major protection risk for refugees is like falling mangoes. So let me just stop there. Uh, wastewater from ablution, from ACs, from gray water, massive asset, especially where we don't have, um, you know, where we have perceived water scarcity and drought and aridity. In the same compound, we have a rub hall. A uh, rub hall is what NGOs use. It's just like a giant kind of permanent tent where we store food distribution, NFIs, non-food items, soap, buckets, that kind of stuff. Because refugees get a kit, like a, you know, basic kit. Um, so, but it collects a lot of water. <laughs> it's a big rooftop. So all of the water from this rub hall was um, pouring down and making its way to our office building and causing damage to the foundation. So what we did is, you know, this is the same site, but in a different perspective. So we, you know, I trained the team in this compound, how to make an A-frame, how to measure the contours, which we did. And then we just started, to, we made a garden. And so now what I did is this is a trench that we leveled on the bottom. You can see the, you know, the, this is the uphill side and this is the downhill side. So this trench is level on the bottom and it goes, I'll show you another picture. We also made um, garden beds, which are here. And um, yeah, I had, I had calculated 132,750 liters just on one side, on this side, that, it, that amount of water is going towards the office building. So, um, I like to say we take water from floods to food. So what we had done here, you can see in this design, it goes, the water goes into this trench, which is level, meaning it's deeper on this side than it is on this side because this is a hill, but the bottom is level. I hope people understand that. It can be hard if you're not familiar with, you know, level. Um, and so then from here, these are on contour swales. So water falls into this trench, everything fills up automatically. The spillway here fills this next swale. And then this spillway goes into a giant mulch basin with like bananas and stuff around it. And then the water now continues well away from the building. So this is, we have, we have solved an engineering question, the flooding by a garden. And by the way, this growth that you're seeing, this was just three weeks later. And this is pure sand, by the way, I forgot to mention, this is pure sand. I developed a whole chicken compost system. So all the sweepings and, and office waste, we have you know over 50, no, we have right, over hundred people in this compound. Food waste and everything goes to the chickens. We make chicken compost, we apply that to the garden, building soil structure to also hold that water. Um, that was from, uh, you know, just a deep bedding system for chickens. So we use their mechanical action and, you know, mechanical traction and nutrient to make compost and bring it back to the garden. So why, why did I do all this stuff in this particular compound? It's because, um, you know, th that team there has a project that they have to implement, uh, but the security situation in Dadaab is really bad. And oftentimes, you know, I, when I go out to the field, depending on the location and the team, um, I'm often surrounded by guards. Um, and I've been in places in Somalia where I have 10 men with AK-47s surrounding me. Uh, so in that, that context, um, I couldn't go out to the field. Like I could go there really momentarily, but I had to use the office compound of the NGO as the training space and the demonstration space so the staff could see in action 
what the design is doing and then try to take it out into the field. And I would run, I would, they would give me 10 minutes to go to the field and give feedback to the team. And I'm just running around screaming <laughs> and the team is taking notes. So it is a challenge. And so because of that, I would try to get um, a bit creative with different tools. Like here, I just took a piece of cardboard and drew things like here's a swale. Uh, these are garden beds. This is a silt trap with like napier grass for fodder. These are big trees. This is a different type of tree. This is wind. This is the evening sun that has a scary face and a smiley face this is the morning sun. And this is a banana circle. So try to create a lot of variation in the design components. So then here, like this is just an example, like let's say this is uphill, this is the evening sun. So how we're trying in a super dry land co desert context, how do we create enough shady verticality, microclimate with perennial stability and integrating all of this design so that everything that grows has some shade or protection. I uh, oh, I forgot to mention, I talk about three thieves of water. There are three thieves of water. Number one, sun. Number two, wind. Number three, slope. So this design or this tool helps to design with farmers that I can't access because of security, uh, but our team can go there. And then they discuss and use these pieces to say, how do we protect from those three thieves of water using these diff many different types of strategies, right? This is not just one thing. It's not just key line or just alley cropping. There's lots of stuff going on here, right? Um, just like there would be in nature. So here's another maybe more digestible model of what I'm talking about here. You know, the idea of, of harvesting water off of the road, which we do a lot of, doing hand dug dams, putting the nutrient source, like the chicken compost up above the garden, like we did in that Dadab compound. Um, you know, growing, integrating fodder with vegetables and market crops and blah, blah, blah. But this is what I would call a sponge farm. So I refer to sponge, you know, shelter, sponge farm, sponge village, sponge camp. Um, so there's that. And then of course, you know, I, I'm just trying to use whatever tools I have at my disposal, but sometimes I'm in an Uber and they send me pictures and I'm like, ah. So I just do some little finger drawings to give feedback to the team and do remote mentoring, even if it's on the fly, even if it's super simple, um, but they understand it. I usually accompany it with like a voicemail or I make videos, I very, very, you know, my, my, my energy really goes to the field teams and the refugees on the ground. I, I kind of prefer usually to deal most directly with them in some cases rather even than the NGO staff. Um, so um, this was, you know, in the Somali region of Kenya. This doesn't look very exciting, but <laughs> given the remote nature of the guidance I had to give, I was quite excited. So you can see a series of interconnected, you know, swales that will spill from one to the next. There's beds and things, you know, the, it wasn't as intensive as I, as I wanted it to be, still working on it. Um, but it's had, you know, impacts like, you know, we're already, we have a number of uh, sites that we are working with <coughs> in Dadaab. I'm also moving away from the term farm. So I told the team here, don't say farm. I, I don't want us to say agriculture because people just get the wrong idea. And I don't want us to say farm because if you say farm, people get a certain image in their mind, which is not the image that I want to promote. So we call them agroecological sites or food forest sites or whatever. These are not that well done. I would have done them differently and I give feedback to the teams, but you can see already this sort of biological uplift. This was you know, this is just in one year of all this water that's being harvested. So do we really have water scarcity in the Somali region of Kenya? Or do we have design scarcity and capture scarcity? Here's just another image. Look at how the, the vegetation is responding. It's just, it's, if you knew this context and that it is like a pit of sand with nothing that can grow, you would find this quite remarkable. So I'm gonna talk about, so I hope that people um, can see, I'm trying to go like higher up in scale to demonstrate the different scales that I've been uh, leading work on. Mm. This, uh, oh, how, can I just check in with, cause I'm not reading any comments. Sure, Rally, uh, let's see, we're, we're a bit in an hour and 15 minutes in. So okay. I'm thinking a thing that we could either do is make, maybe take like a few questions and then come back oh, and let's do that. Station. Well, which slide are you on? You yeah. have slide like 80 or? Um, well, I'm not sure. I like can just try quarters to through. 
But uh, uh, yeah, let's, um, let's open up. Let's do some questions right now. Yeah, any questions? People okay, are so definitely gonna... loving it too. I mean, there's yeah, a lot of great. comments. People want to be you when they grow up. And um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think if we don't have super awesome questions, I mean, you're sharing so much. I'd hate to cut you short. Yeah, as it's well. a lot. Okay, I mean, so I know like it's a lot. But... Here. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that, no, this is just awesome. I mean, I appreciate, you know, like you put so much effort into creating this and, you know, we've done sometimes presentations where people have like three images <laughs> and it's, it's hard to get through a hundred images in an hour. You gotta be, yeah, you get, you know, you gotta like spend 20 seconds on each slide. I'll try oh, to yeah. create so the questions. On the, on the questions. Yeah. Let's start here. So Mara was the first person. She says, Natalie's one of the most compelling speakers ever. I wish I had an obligation. Okay, so she's looking for the recording. Everyone's getting the recording after this. Um, okay, MB says, have there been any successful use of biodigesters to help with decentralized fuel generation and irrigation water byproduct? What does that so, mean? So have you human ever used biodigesters to like deal with human generation. waste? Oh yeah, yeah. There are examples all over the place, but I did design one circular market in Uganda where we had both uh, public toilets and a slaughter slab. Um, sorry for vegetarians and vegans, um, but it's a little concrete slab where animals are processed and then all of that uh, waste um, we are putting into a biogas digester. The energy from that digester is being sold into the market to women. There's a 10 uh, stove top structure. So they're using that fuel that's, again, from human nutrient, which I mean poop, <laughs> keeping poop in the loop, um, human nutrient, slaughter waste, and the bio slurry. This is the exciting part for me, is I designed the bio slurry to be pumped into a forest of giant green clumping bamboo behind the market so that we can have pyrolyzed charcoal, uh, bamboo, and timber to, to reduce the pressure for forest products. So right now, if you go to the market, you'll find charcoal, you'll find tibbers, mostly from eucalyptus. But now we have this giant green clumping bamboo fed from the bio slurry. So yes, and there you'll find examples all over the world uh, on human nutrient for biogas for sure. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So cool seeing, you know, waste being put to good use, especially bio yeah, resources. So Zach is asking, how can we help support and spread awareness about your work? You're doing it. How are people going to get get to you? Well, you said you wanted people to know, like, kind of reach out to you on LinkedIn and yeah, LinkedIn like is that. a great place. I'm, I'm quite active on LinkedIn. I do have Facebook groups. If you search Natalie Topa colon permaculture and resilience design, Natalie Topa colon regenerative communities and circular bioeconomy, which is really about construction. It's more about the physical environment, the built environment. Um, I have Natalie Topa colon seed saving and sovereignty, Natalie Topa colon uh, fungi and mycology, and Natalie Topa colon the permaculture kitchen and home, because I, I don't try to be chefy. Um, but no, I think, you know, the, the opportunity that you guys create, like, I, there's no one else that would allow me to give such a long presentation. And I know there are people, probably some people have logged out, gone to bed, um, but there are people who want more of the story. And if you're trying to give a 12 minute presentation, you can never get into this amount of detail. So, um, I mean, the yeah. good thing yeah, is- Speaking of which, yeah, I mean, you're doing great. I, everyone's loving it. This is, I think, the best webinar we've had so far. I think we could just keep going into your presentation, Natalie, if you're game for it. I'm, I mean, I know. I said I'm no one ever. Thank you, Zach. Yeah, this, I mean, like we got basically the people have only joined, like not, I don't think anybody's really left. Maybe a few people have left, but it's like now we have 101 people attending. So okay. why don't we All let right. it rip? Um, I think there Do is okay, one last question, then we'll get back to it from uh -huh. Frank. He says, hi, Zach, our work is carried out on livestock production. Our soil is de decomposed granite. And when conditions are right, rain naturally penetrates at point of impact. Uh, mm. Pretty long question. Repairs about grazing management. In the first instance, it can be extreme is complete exclusion for the tourists for 12 months. We also use swales, but in a different way to get those in the presentation. 
P.S. I followed the link but failed to get on there. Okay, so this is more of a statement versus a question. So why don't we get back to the old back and, and see what more awesome examples you have. Okay, well, just on that for Frank, I mean, it sounds like soil organic matter is missing, right? Soil organic matter is like the juice. Like it's, if your soils are too clay or they're too sandy, they're missing the soil organic matter, which is the conduit to life, which will either, uh, that will build the soil structure either, either to be more aerated or to be more um, retentive. Okay, let me just continue then. Okay, so this is the farm of Denisa. Denisa is a wonderful woman who was pregnant at the time of this training with a husband who literally did nothing um, the whole entire time. She has since had the baby. Her name is Natalie. Uh, so Denisa lives on a bald mountain, right? Bald men are hot, bald mountains are not. So Denisa's bald mountain was delivering all of this massive water to the back of her house. It was causing, again, foundational damage. Um, and then it was caught and then it went around her house in two giant gullies and creating flooding for farmers downhill. This is also training that we did with Warren. So what we did is we created these long bio swales on contour and there may be people who aren't familiar with swales. A swale is like imagine creating giant long throats in your landscape uh, that become a, a temporary long skinny pond um, when the water comes right the water is coming down and it's perpendicular to the flow of water. So water enters it spreads out and it becomes like a throat just imagine that you're soil your farm is just drinking and drinking and drinking and swallowing all that water and it's quenching this thirst so we did a series of three swales harvesting water from the gully i don't have good pictures of this here right now so it's that's a shame but just imagine a gully what's another name for a gully a ditch uh, or a giant erosive like a mini canyon like a tiny canyon going down the hill so we diverted the water from that canyon coming into this first top swale and also i want to say that her roof you know you can see her house here she has that rooftop that's from iron sheet and then she sweeps the heck all around the compound so the minute all that rainwater reaches her you know hardscape surface <coughs> <coughs> It really starts to like gain speed and pummel down and it was just ripping all of her soil away. Denisa used to only farm maize, which is corn, um, and cassava, which is um, manioc for people on the Americas, I think. Um, so, and she was doing it, she was doing chemical farming. You had little bottles of pesticides everywhere. It was super sad. Her soil was dead. She's poor. They have food insecurity. Her husband is useless, pregnant. Imagine. So we made these giant swales and th these little baskets have little tiny baby trees in them. So this is a baby food forest. So what we wanted is all this water to enter into this food forest. And you can see on the right hand side, every single uh, every single tree has its own water harvesting structure, which we call a smile berm. Um, and in fact, like this one has like a main tree, the long term tree, like let's say a mango. But on on the like the dimples of the smile, we also included bananas or papayas, which are more short term trees. Um, but every single individual tree has its own water harvesting structure, but the pattern itself is in a water harvesting structure because it's in a fish scale pattern, so it's offset. So if water collects here and it's too much, it will spill out and enter into this one, and when that's too much, it will spill out, enter into the swale. The place is a prison for water, okay? It has three swales big ones all in trellises with food forest integration and this was one rainy season later baby natalie is here and baby natalie was born into a jungle of nutrient dense organic food and here you know mom denisa she's harvesting okra which is a traditional vegetable i only bring indigenous seeds so that mom can plant again next year. Why would I give Denisa a fake GMO seed and be like, see ya, good luck buying new seeds next year. Now she can harvest, she has been harvesting seeds, selling seeds, storing seeds, but why? You can just let things, <laughs> like let the seeds drop and grow again. And I, I Denisa doesn't speak English, <clears throat> but, um, you know, I call her with a Swahili speaking person every few months just to see how she's doing, see how baby Natalie is doing. And you can see here those baskets. Can you see those tree baskets? Those are the same ones from the previous 
That's actually over here. So those are the same, same tree baskets. You can barely see them. You don't even know what you're looking at. It's just food on food on food, nutrients, you know, and this was in the beginning of COVID. I forgot to mention market systems have failed. You know, everybody is starving and in poverty. And she's like, you know, Netflix and chill, you know, she's giving food to her neighbors. <clears throat> she's got money uh, by, by the end of this rainy season, after she had harvested everything and was going into the dry season, she didn't have more enough food to continue selling, but she at least had enough food for her entire little family through the entirety of the dry season, which was a revolution for her. Okay. Um, and the only input is knowledge. Can I just stress that the only input is knowledge. Yeah, we brought some local bamboo, we brought some local spades or shovels, you know, uh, but there's nothing about this intervention that required external inputs, things like that. This is in one rainy season, same Denise's farm. Here, see this little tiny footbridge? That's the same, same footbridge within one rainy season. So we are talking about Tanzania. They receive a, a good amount of rain, okay? Um, that's why you're seeing this massive biological uplift. But if I show you this, this was one and a half years later. So this is Denise's kitchen. See that bald mountain? And all this just dry, brittle, you know, look at a one and a half years later, a food forest, cassava, popos, uh, papayas, I mean, bananas, uh, um, I don't know the English names, like amaranth, uh, pump, you know, so many just we planted so many things. <laughs> um, okay, so here's another example. So this, this is now we're going up higher in scale. This is what I refer to as a sponge camp. So here, a training was conducted. Look at, you can even see the sweep marks. Okay, sweeping, 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 sweeping. You know, women in Africa have time poverty because they're doing things often as instructed by men, and it just drives me crazy. You know, women have to go get the water, women have to deal with the food, women have to sweep the compounds, women have to do all of the things while many men sit under a tree and drink tea. So it can be really frustrating. So time poverty is a very big real thing for women here in Africa. And um, anyway, the point is, is that they're sweeping away all the organic material, they're hardscaping, they're compacting the surface, Every, it continues to be more and more impervious and runoffy. Um, and so uh, my former staff here conducted, he was in the field and I was guiding remotely. And, you know, the first thing we did is Ask them, ask questions. You're not the expert there. You don't know anything about this place. So do, you know, guide the, the team, guide the community in an exercise and they will explain to you, they are the experts. They're the consultants on local knowledge. The water flows, that's what she's showing here with his arrows. Where are the main facilities and assets and places and maybe places to avoid or places of nutrient concentration, whatever that might be. So. You know, they send me the mapping and I was sending back various um, types of strategies, you know, on the right. So again, just with my finger on the iPhone and a lot of videos and voice messages. So here they are, they're starting to do what we call planting the rain. Before you plant the crops, before you plant your trees, you plant the rain. And that term comes from um, Zephaniah Peary, who is quoted often by Brad Lancaster, who is also one of my teachers. So planting the rain or planting the water, if it's gray water. It's not all raining gray water, so it's still water. Um, so here, starting at the very top of the system, you know, when you get out of the shower, Zach, do you start drying your feet first or your head first? Usually the head. <laughs> Usually the head. So we start at the top of the system and we wanna catch that water before it starts falling down to the feet. So same with, the, same with our site or our system. Start at the top, stop that water, get it in the soil before it starts pummeling down and creating flood. So that's what's happening here. People getting to work and then starting to integrate verticality and the trees. Don't forget trees. I mean, swales are tree planting systems. And oftentimes here in Africa, when I see permaculture trainings, we have naked swales. What's more awful than that? Nothing. Um, so we got trellises, we've got baby trees, we've got, look at how much mulch. Like, you know, I tell farmers here and community members, if the sun can see your soil, if you can see the soil, the sun can see your soil and the sun's eyes are sucking the life and moisture out of the soil. So cover it, you don't want it to be seen. 
Um, so you can see beautifully, these are double dug beds on contour. So again, 60 to 80 centimeters deep, filled with all kinds of spongy organic material, you know, which will also be fed not only from the, the runoff that's coming from rain, but the run on, right? We, we, uh, if for water, guys, I, um, we talk a lot about run off, but not run on, right? How are we holding water in the system that is trying to exit? That's one thing. But the other thing is water, which is passing by or coming from up above, how do we get that into our system? So, you know, that's, we're doing a couple things here. So look at this. This is a prison for water. Water cannot leave. Okay. These are security checkpoints, you know, show your COVID vaccine card at every, every one of these, or you're not passing. This is three weeks later. I mean, you're just creating this biological uplift, nutrient, water, where water accumulates, life generates. I can't remember who that's a quote from. It might be from Jeff or from Bill Mullison. I don't remember, but you get the point. This is six weeks later. Same, same place, guys, the same place. Remember that white, barren, concrete looking land? The other thing that, we, um, that I show the teams to do is because we have, see this grass roof, water falls and starts to accumulate and add to flood, we do these roof water beds. So again, these are deep 60 to 80 centimeters um, and they're along the line of the roof. You have to be careful with these because if you have earthen homes, obviously the, that residual moisture can um, <clears throat> you know, compromise the earthen structure. So be mindful of that. And the, the household here was very mindful. Of that. They know that that could be a risk and they're monitoring it, but they really wanted to do it. So again, water nutrient captured, stored and held in protected soils and structures. I just love this because it was so quick. And look at this is for six weeks from this to this. And now eight weeks later, Look at, it's just like this, the things are coming up over the trellises, the pumpkins, the, and this brings down the heat island effect, right? That when you have those bare naked hard surfaces, they start bouncing temperature and heat and light and just creating this like hot misery. And this is this like cool jungle, you know, cool green jungle-ness. Um, so, okay, uh, I'm just trying to move on quickly. So here is another example where in this valley, people were dying from flood. You don't think it's a very steep flood, I mean, valley, but literally people were dying here. So we have, as it accumulated downhill. So this is the top of the system. We made a hundred meter swale, which you can't really see here. And then we did a giant food forest. Well, not giant, it was like 50 to 60 trees. But this is what I was talking about. You see this, when I talk about fill and spill interconnected circuits, take a look at this. You see, there's a swale. There's a stone armored spillway and always you have to have spillways on swales people and the rule of thumb, the, the minute I just said there was no rules of thumb I lied here's one. Um, your spillway should not be less than the width of the berm and the swale. That means this is too small, <laughs> but you get my point, this is the width of your spillway. So water enters here from uphill, it spills out and it goes doo -doo 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 and it co comes now into this swale. This is a prison for water, okay? Water is getting stuck here. So that's how we reduce flooding in that valley. I'm gonna now quickly go to Burundi. This, um, we had five young boys who died on this mountain in Burundi due to flash floods, massive water events. And please take a look at this footpath. Do you see this trail footpath, footpath? footpath. Many gullies form along footpaths because the footpaths are becoming compacted hardscape. So water gains energy from speed, volume, depth, and, um, and drop elevation. That's when you get those head cuts, right? Like the rip uphill. So the footpath was the cause of these gullies and they keep just stepping to the next, you know, as the gully is growing and growing, they just keep shifting the footpath over to the left, to the left, and it's eating the farm of the guy next door or the late woman next door. So this can be, you know, conflict as people start walking on that farm to not fall into the gully. So big problems. What we did is, um, you know, train the community here to understand that the relationship between the flow of water, the destruction, the gullies, the erosion, and these, these incidents of death.
So starting at the very top, we unbalded the, you know, we did a bit, lot of chop and drop on the trees on the top of the mountain, different interventions, gully plugging, uh, check, um, you know, one rock dams, check dams. So actually I was here with Daniel Lawton and <laughs> it, was, it was here that I was evacuated um, when COVID hit and I was in the last plane out of Burundi when they closed their airspace. It was pretty insane. Mm. And Daniel had to go home prematurely. He was only with us for two days in the field and he had to go home to Australia. So starting at the very top of the mountain on those footpaths that where the water starts to gain speed. And these are the same footpaths that created the downhill gullies. So every one meter, check dam, check dam, check dam, check dam. Why do we use stones? That's what we had. We just use what we have to start to try to slow down and pacify and pull that energy out of the water. So, okay, these are animated. These are not real before and after pictures. Just let me put a disclaimer. So imagine here you have your hill. Here's your, you know, the, the water that goes down the footpath and starts creating gullies. So what we wanted to do is get that into the farms and turn that water from flood to food, as I always say, or from destruction to production. So getting that water off of the footpath into the farm on swales, into, into you know, food forests, into smile berms, until you have, you know, a fully established system. And this is what that looks like in real life. So, you know, this is the footpath that goes down to those gullies you saw. And here, and, you know, Brad Lancaster was great. He was, you know, really on Facebook Messenger with me as I was trying to make sure I was doing all the stuff correctly because, you know, you can create major siltage. When you're asking water to take a turn, what's happening is that that turbidity is carrying lots of debris and lizard tails and feathers and seeds and nutrient silt. And when you are asking water to take a sharp turn, in that moment that the water slows down and changes its speed, it drops out all of that silt and then you get a building up of silt and the water then can just jump over your structure. So you have to desilt. Okay, so here's a little farden, sponge garden, sponge farm. So again, you can just see we're, we're just using the natural contours of the land and trying to create that absorption of moisture. And um, this is Mediatrice uh, and her son. And this is just in a perma garden that she made around her home. And of course we do encourage people if they're doing mulched um, structures to use household gray water. But anyway, we just had 100% <coughs> food security <coughs> increase during COVID. And we had, we stopped the flooding on the mountain in one year. These are the gullies. We came in and we did gully plugging <coughs> where, you know, yeah, these are not going to last, clearly, hashtag obvious, but they're locally available materials. Look at banana stalks. That's going to decompose within a, a, you know, a season. But in the meantime, it's going to trap and sieve a bunch of debris and material that will start to tear us off that gully. And... <clears throat> And this is what happened. It started to, you can see, it starts to silt up, fill in. We planted things, but there was all this, you know, recruitment to vegetation. But we did plant things that people want to use, like lemongrasses and tithonia um, for pest control and lots of stuff. Now look at what happened. Uh oh, oh yeah. Look, well, a year later, <laughs> can you see this totally filled in gully? This was not one of the deep, one, deeper ones, but it was a major one where nobody could farm here before because of the flood water. And this is land reclamation through restoration. So we we plugged those gullies and now this land became usable again. Please note they're continuing with bad agricultural practices which are going to continue the problem. So the you know it's really about the software, the engagement. And here we had you know every week doing walking tours with the government, with governors, and it has spread by the way to the surrounding colline. Colline en français is the hill. So the surrounding hills has already started to spread because there's nothing from outside. Only knowledge was the only input, but they have everything they need to get this done and they've seen the impact and they're doing it. So uh, infrastructure, roads here in Africa, we have mitre drains that send water to literally just away from the road and that's it. So here what we've done is <clears throat> where we're, um, this was a project that was grading the roads, but that's not enough, right? That's just a lost opportunity. So the, and, you know, we want to protect the investment of the roads. These are dirt roads and these are market access roads. So the, we want to get the water off of the road as quickly as possible so it can stay dry and 
possible. And then that water instead can go into the fields. This field here is a farmer named Opoki. The water you know, came, we did this diversion drain, 2% grade, and then leveled it off onto contour, which is 0% grade. And then here is where he was farming rice. I was there the day he harvested the rice. He harvested the rice and we're walking in the field and it's soggy and full of water. We're like, oh, pokey, plant more rice right now. Jesus, what are you doing? So like, that's just to show you how storing that water in the soil has economic benefits, nutrition benefits. So uh, also this was a place that got completely flooded. You could not drive through here. So what we did is, you know, the, from here, we made a, a diversion ditch, also 2% grade. We leveled it off onto contour. This is also with Warren, by the way. Um, and then we part, we literally like picked the flood up and put it into this dam. There's a borehole here, which also became recharged, right? Because we're like, this water is infiltrating in deep into the groundwater, uh, the water table. And then that, like when, after we recharged this borehole, the women were like one pump, like with a finger, like, you know, and water was just spewing out. They, they were so happy. Though this pond now has fish in it. Oops. It has fish inside, they use it for livestock watering, they use it for crop production. And there was a guy who, <laughs> this young guy who's 20 years old, hadn't been married yet, which is like, you know, weird in this context. And so he was able to use the water from this pond to construct a mud house. He got a wife and he's super excited. And now he's building another house and probably another wife is coming. So great. Okay, so this is my friend's uh, my friend's house, she lives on a conservancy and has a permaculture farm. And it was funny, she actually asked me to help her with some cob building. So I brought crocs because I thought it was going to be stomping mud. But when I showed up, there was a big bulldozer and she said, actually, can you build me two dams? Because my uh, airplane hangar is getting flooded. So, and you know, she wants to reduce flooding in the compound. So, and she had made one dam, but it was not, um, it was just wasn't very well made and it was very small. So. Uh, this is actually, these are the two dams that I made. Um, I started them. I only had two days. So, um, this was with a bulldozer operator who really wasn't very happy that a woman was telling him how to operate his scoops. Um, but we made, <coughs> this is what they look like after they've been filled up a bit. And the top one actually, um, I had an issue with sealing it, but um, my friend was able to use pigs to glade the pond quite successfully. So this is what it looks like, taking water off of, and you know, I left her with assignment to finalize like the extension of this swale, the extension of this swale on here and here. But here the system goes like this, water comes pummeling down, we're turning it into this pond to increase the catchment because it's quite flattish here. So there's not a lot of catchment for the pond to fill passively. So when you do a pond with swales, it's like you have these arms reaching out to the landscape, pulling water into the pond. So water from the road. And then also, you know, all this water that's falling downhill will also come here into this pond. Then I made about a 20 foot spillway because I was really nervous about back flooding into the road. So a 20 foot spillway here, which was gonna direct water be picked up through this lower swale. And this, this pond is actually this one, this one here. And that is not only for livestock, but this is a conservancy. So zebras, wildebeest, giraffes, you know, all those people come to drink from, from that pond. All right, we're getting uh, towards the end somehow. This is the sponge village of Otego. Um, this is a project that we did. Warren and I, I, I called Warren and I said, I want to do a big village. We had 190 people. We had six machines, two excavators, two bulldozers, two dump trucks, two weeks. We arrived to this village and there were clear erosion scars, massive um, flooding and erosion evidence across the landscape. There were, you know, tree stumps everywhere and charcoal pits. They'd cut down the community had cut down so many of the trees and were using them as charcoal, which is a major income source for, for poor people. They had also had this, can you see that little crawl with tiny little micro cows? <laughs> and then here we had this village. Then they also had a road alongside that was carrying flood down to the Nile River, which was totally swelling. So what we did is created this whole interconnected circuit of fill and spill structures. We did a valley tank at the very, very top. That one is called Warren Dam. And then water, this is a 2% channel that came and dumped into these on-contour bioswales. So again, filling and spill, fill, spill, fill, spill, fill, spill. And then down here, we have the silt trap. 
This is Natalie Dam, it's the biggest dam. Um, and the chief here had a little baby daughter named Natalie. It's so coincidental, it's amazing. <laughs> um, and then this one is Martin Dam. So this is machine dug, machine dug, hand dug. And then here we did gully plugging with stones and bamboo. We had food forests. And then we took an excavator and harvested all this water off of the road and dumped it into the perma garden here, which we made below the cows because that passive flowing of nutrient, we wanted to make sure to capture that into our perma garden, which has bioswills on contour, double dug beds, and little you know food forest pockets above and below to protect from the sun. So this, this project did have some issues. Um, at, okay, this is not to scale, obviously, but this guy that lives here, there was a latrine that um, was really near the swale and it started to get flooding from up, you know, from below. So, you know, some changes and adjustments had to be made here. Um, but this is to scale. This is what it looks like in plan view from Ariel. And, um, you know, here's the gully. This is the hand dug dam. That's Natalie Dam, the big machine one. The valley dam is out of the frame. Um, here was a food forest, food forest. This is the road on the right. And then here is the, you know, why we made it in between these houses is because that was literally the only contour line that we could identify with the laser level that met up below this um, cows, which is the nutrient source. So this is what it looks like. These are some of the swales. This is Natalie Dam, which you can't tell how big it is here, but it's seriously huge. Now moving on really quickly, and I am getting a little bit towards the end here. Sorry for that we're taking long, but this is spring recharge, okay? Oh, I'm, that title is wrong. So this is the eye of a spring. There's a road down at the bottom here, which we connected this harvesting, I mean, this bioswale on contour, and any excess water from that bioswale spills into this dam, which can you see those teeny tiny little people? I'm one of those people on that ridge of this dam. So it's quite sizable. But if you see here, this is a food forest and food forest, you know, the one thing I wanna say, I, I hear so many people plant, 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 trees, trees, trees. And even like literally like world agroforestry or people who are tree people like institutions with a lot of funding and they just put a hole in the ground and a tree in it. That's not okay. You have to understand the context of that tree, make a water harvesting structure, mulch. Like there's a lot of things that go into just planting a tree. So here, this whole food forest on contour, everyone has a water harvesting smile burn. So each one of these is a water harvesting structure. And that is recharging the spring eye, which here in another spring where we did the same exact thing, water harvesting swale on contour off of the road, excess dam, which is used for livestock watering and irrigation. This is the spring eye, which they made a box around. And now there's so much water flowing, it, you feel guilty that you can't turn the tap off. But the excess, can you see this route where that water also goes to the overflow pond? That is this channel right here. So water, this is what is the source of this water here. And that just flows into the dam. And then it has a spillway that continues down the natural path of the water. So we're not changing, right? We're not changing the core. I get this conversation, uh, this question a lot. Well, you know, you're messing up the hydrology, sending the water in a different route. No, we're not. We're just borrowing. We're just like putting it into a bank account and then let, and then whatever's left over, we're putting it, sending it on its merry way. And this has increased the water quality and the water flow by, I made a video on it and I can't remember. It used to take like 30 minutes to fill a one hour, I mean a 20 liter jerry can and now it takes like one minute and 10 seconds. Okay, so this is the last portion of the presentation, I think, I hope. I went to Yemen and it was so profoundly amazing and interesting. Uh, we have an, you know, there's an incredible team I was working with there. Mm. And I was told all the, the gendered things about Yemen. Men won't listen to me, whatever. But I found the opposite to be true. They literally did every single thing that I said. So it was just interesting to go through and see all the different interventions the team was trying to do that were related to water, managing water, managing flood, capturing water. So here we, I just spent weeks going through the whole entire, well, not the whole country, but from North to South. Um, try, you know, explaining so many different flows. I also want to point out here, can you see the roundness, you know, like a, like a, like a woman lying down for those who, you know, relate to that, um, that contour, when you have that soft, 
you know, contour shape of the hilltop, that tells you water, I mean, trees used to be there, right? They used to pacify the water before it jackhammered. If you go to the south of the country in Aden, very jagged angular mountaintops, that is from water behavior. This is new, this is new baldness, okay? <laughs> um, then they showed me these incredible, um, dams, you know, water harvest, surface water retention systems that they are doing. And some of these are archaeological rehabilitation. There I am, surrounded by a bunch of men. Um, and the team here is, they, they were doing concrete, 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 concrete. I hate concrete. Concrete, human beings consume more concrete than food, okay, by metric ton. Remember, first concrete, then water, then food. It is ecologically destructive to produce. You can never get rid of it. You can only make it smaller. It sucks. Stop using it. We have better alternatives that as we transition into a new ecological civilization, we are doing. But when I saw this and I could see in the landscape, there was some kind of lime-ish quality. I asked them, do you have limestone and do you polish it using olive oil soap? Because I studied Tadalact with Sigi Coco. If anyone wants to do natural building courses, Google S-I-G-I, Sigi Coco, K-O-K-O. -K -O. I've done a number of natural building courses with her and I learned Tadalact, which is a Moroccan high atlas way of taking lime um, plaster and mechanically and chemically sealing it with a gemstone and olive oil soap. So when I asked them, they were like, hold my beer. They didn't say that. They don't drink there. But they marched me up to the top of this mountain and they showed me this ancient <laughs> little watering hole on the top of that same mountain that was historically done hundreds of years ago with Tadalact. This is their form of polished lime plaster called Kadav. And it, it looked like a spa, like, you know, you could put in some, you know, glass of wine and candles and I will hang out there happily, <laughs> maybe clean up that water a bit. But um, so I said to them, stop immediately with the concrete. Let's go back to the Kadav. Let's create this economic multiplier effect of having locally produced plasters um, that are more ecological and it's part of heritage security, right? We don't want Yemen to lose its identity because it's being bombed by Saudi, bankrolled by US. Like these are real humans with an incredible rich history. We wanna protect it, we wanna celebrate it. And when you do this in a place that people are suffering from war and conflict and bombing, they loved it. They absolutely loved it. They stopped the concrete. The government is so happy. The architecture school is happy. And they're doing these um, archaeological rehabilitations using the natural historic Khadad. I also told them, can we just stop sealing the ponds and see what happens? So this is what they did. So I wouldn't have shaped this this way. This does not take advantage of the natural contours of the land. It's a giant square. And I told, I had mentioned to them something about putting tree, like islands, like so you can plant trees. And they're like, oh, look at what we made. We made this for you and we made a tree island for you. I was like, okay, that looks like Mesopotamia, but that's amazing. So anyway, it harvests water and you can see how mucky and filthy this water is, but it's huge. And I said, don't seal it. That water soaks into the landscape to the tune of the government has sent hydrogeologists to check it out. They have determined on this site alone, this is actually different sites, Farmers have one additional month of groundwater irrigation from clean water based on this harvesting that we are doing. The governorates surrounding Sada, where this is located, have started to adapt this. We did another site where they did a same similar large water harvesting structure for groundwater recharge. And there was a major water event. And five days after this major water event, one kilometer away. This family sent photos to our team and they said this well dried up years ago and it is now full. And look at that water, you can even see underneath. So I'm ending this presentation on a, a photo I took in South Sudan you know, 15 years ago and it says there's nothing gloomy about our future. It's highly ironic if you know what's happening in South Sudan because they continue to be in war and conflict, but I just, felt that this picture was like hope because you can see how there's really nothing surrounding this woman, this woman, um, but there's hope. And so anyway, that is the end of my presentation. This is another drawing that I made in South Sudan with a woman uh, carrying a bundle of sticks and twigs on top of her head. So a little agroforestry thing, but uh, that was in 2006 that I drew that. So that's the end of the presentation. I'm aware it has taken
behavioral time and apologies for that. Thanks so much to the organizers for the opportunity to tell this whole story, which I've never told it to this extent. So I hope, I hope I'm still online. <laughs> um, <Yay>. And that's it. <laughs> Really, thank you. That yeah, was that was ass. incredible. God, what a journey. I, I'm blown away. I think everyone here is too. That's just stunning. The 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 work that you've <laughs> done is incredible. You know, like how many lives have you saved? How many villages have you helped? I mean, I've incredible. not done this alone. You know, I'm. I work with teens. Yeah. I work with porn. I work with a lot of. This is not a story about me. This is a story about the work, and what can be done. What is possible that anybody can do. You know, I mean, we live on a planet with. This is just a story about gravity. Gravity is the hero here. <laughs> cool. Well, there's a few. So barking dogs. There's a few. Yeah, uh, I, can, I can do the question. Yeah, how about you yeah. take over while I deal with this? Yeah. Story. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, just amazing, awesome presentation. A lot of people saying you should write a book. A lot of people saying they want to be you when they grow up, that they'd love to learn from you. Um, I know we'd love to keep hosting you. Are people seeing the, I think I'm sharing the wrong screen here. Um, first question we got, um, when you're placing many small smile berms, um, the Arunas on a landscape, how do you go about placing and sizing them to allow all to receive run on even when multiple rows are placed down slope of each other on contour? And can you also design them to encourage sheet flow? Um, I mean, if you did bermless smile berms, you could, but you know, you don't really need to do that. You don't need to do sheet flow with smile berms because you want a little reservoir for every tree. Um, and then what we do when we make the smile berms is we make one side a little bit lower. So automatically, uh, automatically we, you know, the water has a as, has an exit route that will go to the next one. But just really quickly, so people understand, like, Let's say, you know, if you've got your site and this is like a mountain, um, you, what we do is we, we start to measure like the longest contour uh, on the site. And then we measure out like three meters or four meters um, that and those, those holes become the tree planting hole. And then from here, that's where we start to make the smile berm around each planting hole. And then we use string to triangulate. I don't know if you guys can see this, you know, to try, we take a triangle of string and that's where we position the next row. And it's not going to be perfect because, you know, your, your topography is doing all kinds of things. So, you know, so you just, you, you measure a contour, a long contour, and then you do, depending on how dense you want your forest or a food forest, we do three or four meters between each planting hole on contour. And then using the smile berm, Anyway, so I don't know if that answers the question, but you know, we start and then and then we make you can do the triangle of string above. So you go down below from the from the longest contour and then above. And it's like a fish scale. You know what I mean by fish scale? It always looks like like boobs when I do this. I don't know how else to do it. Um all right, well, here's a forest of boobs. <laughs> um, but you see what I mean by fish scale? So they're offset. I mean, I think in the bill in the in Bill Mullison's permaculture design manual, there's also guidance there. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think that answered it well. Um, next question from Mark. Love your presentation. Here in Hawaii, we have steep denuded slopes with increasing flood and drought events. During flood rains, stormwater rushes into the ocean, depositing sediment and killing our reefs. Can you provide successful examples of large scale stormwater mitigation on steeper slopes in the subtropics? Uh, I don't know about specific examples, but you know, you can't do swales on very steep slopes, but you can do other interventions. Like if it's tree planting or 
uh, or or root based retention, right? So um, when you're talking about low tech erosion control, and it's not only erosion of the soil, it is like if there's chemicals and all of the silt that's flowing into the ocean, again, you know, it's many different small, small, small strategies. Like it might be check dams or one rock dams or leaky weirs or gully plugging and tree systems and vetiver or other deep rooted bamboo. Like, I'm sure that um, Hawaii has its own bamboo structures and that, I mean, bamboo um, species, and that can really help to stabilize uh, soil. So again, just make sure that like you just, I feel like permaculture is an anti-gravity movement. Like we're just trying to make sure that nothing moves. So it can be logs, it can be banana sticks, it can be uh, stalks. It can be so many things that you're just trying to respond to the natural contours of the land to, you know, to um, capture and sieve that siltation before it starts to, you know, roll downhill into the ocean. So, you know, you just have to create a series of traps, stones, big stones, small stones, you know, it. that's a, I'd have to see the site, but Really, I would say, you know, being gentle with a landscape, nature is a moving bus that you want to jump onto. You're not going to strong arm nature and win. Okay. This is when we start to talk about masculine versus feminine approaches within permaculture, within land restoration, be feminine, like just have a more gentle, you know, step by step, strategic, many things, you know, systemically coming together. It is a system. You're trying to harvest and filter out those contaminants or whatever before they reach the place that you don't want them to reach, which in your case is the ocean or the water bodies. So it's a tough question to ask, but hope, hope you're getting the anti-gravity energy. <laughs> Yeah, I think that did a really good job of answering it. Um, next question uh, that actually I saw in the chat a couple of times too. Um, are there any problems with snakes in these areas? Uh, wondering about the mulch and dangerous creatures. And then also asking about mosquitoes and do the holding ponds move quickly enough to avoid becoming incubation spaces for their eggs or how to manage that in those contexts? Okay, so if we're talking, okay, yes to all. Um, in the training we did in the sponge village, like under every rock that we lifted, we had 190 people lifting a lot of rocks. Under all, like so many of them, we had scorpions and baby scorpions and scorpion baby nests. And we, I lifted one up and there were literally hundreds of little white baby scorpions. Snakes, yes, we have spitting cobras, we have black mambas, we have whatever's. Yes, that is an issue with mulch. If Bill Mollison were here or somebody say, okay, cats, uh, birds, if you have snakes, make sure you have trees, make sure you get those birds of prey into your system. So look at it systemically. Absolutely. You can't live in isolation or live the chemical way. If you want to just spray chemicals and kill everything and then live in your little house. But this is the balance. As we transition into an ecological civilization, these are the kinds of things we have to figure out how to balance. So either it's going up the food chain or figuring out how do we mitigate that. But absolutely, grass roofs, grasslands, mulches, all of those are habitat for wildlife, including frogs, lizards, snakes, but those people are important part of the system. And don't forget, it's important to differentiate between snakes. Here in East Africa, a lot of people fear all snakes and don't decipher between, okay, that one's not harmful. I'll leave that one. That one's actually helpful. That one eats rats and kills rodents and pests to my farm versus that is a deadly thing, let's relocate it immediately. In the camp in South Sudan, when I lived in a tent, we had six foot spitting cobras. They would spit in people's eyes, blind them temporarily. So yes, it is a risk, but that's the, that's the, you know, the design challenge we have as humans is how do we return to becoming a part of nature in urban and rural areas and manage these risks and perceived risks. Yeah, water, awesome. Somebody called me a water protecting eco socialist. That's really funny because I'm about to try to make some um, some new business cards, and I was kind of toying with like water harvesting socialist feminist, water harvesting. I don't know. I'm I'm still working with it. So glad to see that idea. Water harvesting social feminist. No, water harvesting feminist atheist. I don't know. We're still working on it. 
Well, definitely. Ironing water I don't want to lead with that one. Definitely, Maybe let definitely it come water woman in there would be awesome. And Zach, you know, uh, Rajendra Singh was here in my house uh, some weeks ago, and it was funny. He walked in. He was like, "I am the water man," and I was like. I'm the water woman. It was just really a funny moment because I didn't, I don't really self-identify necessarily as like a water person. I'm a, I feel like water, soil, plants, earthworks, regenerative design person. So I was so happy when you guys are like, oh, focus on water because I've never done that. If you, if you had asked me to do a presentation on agroforestry or a soil or I could have, it would have been another two hour journey. And I think, like you said, like it's such an important piece to lead with. There's so many tree planting projects around the world where they're just sticking hundreds, thousands, millions of trees in the ground and accepting that three quarters of them are going to die because they're not planting the rain before planting the trees. Yeah. Um, yeah, we don't, question, we don't want to plant trees. We want to grow trees. Those are different. Totally. Um, question from Roberto. Have you had issues with fire? And what do you do in those cases to prevent it? Um, I mean, we haven't, you know, I and, and, and the work that I've been doing haven't had direct issues with fire, but, you know, as I mentioned, I mean, the more the landscapes become, you know, trees provide a buffer from some of these landscape disasters, including fire, because trees provide windbreak, and when they're removed, wind gusts become much stronger, and, you know, so, um, Ecological degradation does increase fire risk. And, you know, again, when I was in Colorado last month, we had 600 homes, uh, you know, it was on the news, 600 houses <coughs> burned up in one night. 30,000 people were displaced. I was so angry about that because the homes were made of timber. And I am a natural building aficionada. And if you haven't read that book by Naomi Klein called the shock doctrine. I encourage all permies, all regenerative people, have your own shock doctrine, have your own counter shock or green shock doctrine. Because the premise of the book is that, you know, up their sleeves, you have corporate, you know, and government and corrupt people who are just waiting for that moment that a society is brought to its knees so they can push through policies that no one would otherwise ever accept. We, as a regenerative movement and the you know global ecological conscience movement must have our own shock doctrine the next time 600 you know homes come up in flames we are knocking at the door of policymakers protests with, with not just picket signs but <laughs> policy paper here it is we want to be able to build earthen homes rammed earth cob houses uh, super adobe earth bag houses that are resistant to fire flood earthquakes bullets bombs whatever your risk is where you are so no i don't have i've not had to do this, but don't forget that fire goes uphill um because oxygen rises and it's like, like you know anyway fires tend to really rapidly move uphill so if you have a site you have to definitely think about the types of trees, how wind is interacting with your site. And if you haven't checked out the permaculture manual by Bill Mullison, you know, how you create the physical and build and um, ecological structures on your site can totally shift the, the wind patterns. And those wind patterns with oxygen are what will fuel fire. Um, but I also don't want us to paint fire as the bad guy. There are ancient civilizations and indigenous cultures that have actively successfully used fire ecology to manage their ecosystems for a long time. So dig deeper on that. Let's not just be anti-fire. We yeah, I love the, the, love the piece about the shock doctrine too. And I saw firsthand, I was in Australia in the 2020 fires and everyone was ready to change right then. Like if you had very clear legislation that allowed some of this water harvesting and, you know, they just used it to pass more corrupt legislation that further so, the water scarcity issues. But you're right. We need a counter shock doctrine for those points in time. Have it ready, have it printed, <laughs> like it's ready to go right now. And then the minute that shock happens, you show up and just, you know, there are lawyers and people who are within the regenerative movement, policymakers. We've like, we need to have literally like a deck of cards of our counter shock policies. 
Yeah, that well, we know it's coming. We know like but, mega fires are coming and water scarcity is coming. So yeah, it'd be super useful to have those ready to go. Like my, yeah, my cousin's and, house pretty much burned all got within a football field of burning down that boulder in that boulder fire, like one football field. Like they just got lucky. Yeah. yeah like it, it's crazy. And the thing is, is that like, let's back the truck up for a second. Why are we not allowed to build structurally set you know cob is load bearing it is structural you know to have an it you only need six inches of correct ratios even four inches for a, a internal interior wall of properly ratioed cob to be structural and load bearing okay six inches for external walls you can go thicker and you know do like you know like the straw bale width you know and there are insulative thermal mass reasons for doing that but the fact that we are not allowed to build that is infuriating and there are reasons why that is there are agendas between timber industries steel industries governments and sorry guys but i have to say these are male dominated industries okay i don't want to like bombard people with feminism but let's be really real these are male dominated industries whose agenda is corruption and profit and exclusive and there's no there's no space for that anymore we must be allowed to build resilient houses that have interior climate control that you know i wasn't okay i never go to the us for different reasons i go there very rarely you know every three five years and i stayed with home i stayed in friends homes and they're freezing and there's paying out of the nose for heating and interior climate control and the you know the walls are thin and they're timber and drywall i was like this is insane how can you even how is it possible that th this is what is legal and everything else is illegal but we have to call it pre-legal and push so get all your friends write the policies now have a glass of wine or whatever you want to have <laughs> and you know just develop those things and get ready the second that any disaster comes you are there with a regenerative policy a regenerative approach for housing natural building flood mitigation water harvesting urban design it's endless it's a system it's all all the parts of it sorry i get emotive about this because it's inexcusable that we're allowed to do such destructive degenerative things at the highest price with the lowest sense making you know okay sorry next question and at the same time the things that make sense are not only not incentivized they're illegal we're not even allowed yeah. to do them i i totally agree 100 percent. call it pre-legal no more illegal yeah i like that pre-legal yeah that's what they say in quail springs you know in california pre-legal everything's pre-legal like that well, we got it. It's good set up, like, because we know fire is going to happen. We know floods are going to happen. Just having those things ready to go. Like, okay, we're water retention legal plan back. Just yep. ready to go. Okay, so quick question uh, for follow up from Roberto. Are you thinking about creating an educational training online? Natalie's Natalie's master class, anything like that? Uh, um, maybe. I mean, you know, I'm in a bit of a transitional period because I've been working with these large agencies as a full time employee for years, decades. Um, but I'm trying to sort of venture out and I'm independent right now. Um, so <laughs> my plan right now is to take a break, sleep for like a week, get a mani and a petty and then see what happens next. I still have some assignments uh, that I'm doing privately consulting in South Sudan um, and some courses I wanna take. So I'm open to anything, who knows? Yes, why not? Maybe later. Cool. Um, but I, I do, um, anyone who like, there are some people who um, are familiar with my, my Facebook and LinkedIn pages and, or LinkedIn, whatever profiles. I, when I'm in the field and doing trainings with the teams, I am constantly documenting. I mean, just like iPhone videos, not anything fancy, but I try to document and share out everything that I do. Um, it's mostly for the refugees and people that I support, but it's open to everyone and they're public. So once again, if you check out those Facebook groups, you'll see a lot of content that I share out. It's not formalized in classes, but maybe that's something in the future that I could do. If these guys like, Zach and Raleigh show me how to do it. <laughs> and Natalie, yeah. along those lines, I lost the comment, but someone was asking specifically from somewhere in Africa, but a couple of people asked if people want to learn from you, that's those LinkedIn channels are probably the best place to follow up or how should they reach out to you? Yeah, LinkedIn, obviously. So Natalie Topa is my name. If you search that in LinkedIn, you'll find me. And I do post a lot there and Facebook, um, 
yeah, I mean, I'm quite reachable on, yeah. The, but Facebook, you know, I'm 45, right? I've got like seven gray hairs going on. So I'm a Facebooker. <laughs> Snapchat, no way. I don't even know how to spell Snapchat. So um, I'm old school with my social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, tweeting, Twitter. I don't know. I don't use that a lot. Instagram, maybe I'll do more this year. But there's cool. also like, you go to, if you do go to YouTube, there's a lot, of, I mean, not a lot, but there are a number of videos that I've done or produced. So number one, if you search balcony permaculture, again, I'm starting at the smallest scale. If you go to YouTube and Google, see, see how old school I am, go to YouTube and Google balcony permaculture or the resilient Colleen, or actually I can probably drop some links. Where do I drop links? Um, oh, you just well, slap anyway. them in the chat box. Okay, well... I'll do that. I'll do that. You guys can move on to the next question. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, so, so you also in, really, really, once you ask this, answer this question, he's like, please, please. Who? He's saying, Natalie, I have a hundred questions for you, but one problem that oh, bothers Josie, me. Oh, Josie, the woman. She's a, from her yeah. family's from here, but she lives in Uganda. Uh huh. Oh, nice. Okay, you know her. Awesome. But her question is a hundred questions for you, but the one problem that bothers me the most is the one of drinking water. Do you have any examples of roof water harvesting for drinking water? All over the world, you know, women are going out, hiking miles to fetch water and bring it back in 20 liter jerry cans. Meanwhile, you know, we have a thousand square feet roofs that can collect 550 gallons of water. Is there any place or any way that you see people collecting their own roof water for drinking water? Yeah, so, um, hi, Jyothi, hope you're doing okay. Um, Actually, I met her cousin when I was at Vandana Shiva's course. Um, so yeah, drinking water. So it depends on the scale. Use your rooftops, any surfaces you have to collect water. Even if it's a tarp, you literally can take a tarpaulin plastic sheet on some timbers and just make a funnel. Like it can be really, really easy. Just, but, but I also want to push us a little bit because um, I, the, a lot of the solar farms that I see are such wasted opportunities because they create dead spaces. That's why I encourage either agrivoltaics or uh, it, urban integration of solar, you know, PV panels. So drinking water, if it's rooftop water, I mean, the old, you know, you can filter it, but uh, there are people, if you went to Jeff Lawton's farm and, and <laughs> Australia and talked about filtering water, you would get laughed at because the, the water that falls free, fresh, nitrogen rich directly from the sky is among the healthiest water you can possibly have. Water is in three sources, okay? Primary water is that which I described, fresh, free, and nitrogen rich from the sky. And uh, that is, you know, and that we, that's primary water. Secondary water is surface water retention, lakes, ponds, dams, riverbeds, um, and then tertiary water, which is groundwater systems. Humans, because we're dumb uh, and lazy, like that's our first, and we don't understand ecological um, and hydrological cycles. We're not hydroliterate. We don't, we immediately go to the tertiary source as our primary source. That's why in the Southwest of Colorado and California and Arizona and Utah, they're freaking out because they've been just sourcing water from near, from neighboring hydrological cycles, but we're not putting back, we're not nurturing and investing in the ecological infrastructure and trees, then ecosystem function that ensures our water security. There's only one unit of water on our planet, okay? It's either changes from gas or a liquid or a solid. So the problem is it's changing locations and forms, but we can recall it um, in most cases, if we're not too late, some landscapes can become so brittle that they're almost irreversible, but pro tip, 23,000 years later, the earth flips on its axis, Sahara becomes a wetland, so be patient <laughs> or harvest water from roofs, surfaces, PV, you know, solar panels, tarps, sheets. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the scale, but um, Brad Lancaster's videos, just search Brad Lancaster. He has a website called something like rainwaterharvesting.com or something like that. Um, and he can tell you around his home in his neighborhood and larger landscapes, things that are done. Also Bill Zydek or Zydek um, and uh, Art Ludwig. 
Art Ludwig L U D W I G. Like those are those are some people who are really in that space. I would say of sort of urban home water harvesting, and we need more women in the space. Can I just please make a plea, guys? Like. I want to see women in excavators, women operators. I, I want us to see more images of one another actively doing, you know, in permaculture, women, I feel like many of them kind of hover around the home and garden space. And now in, in that, you know, of course, we have women in the regenerative movement at the farm scales. But when you talk about the big stuff, right, the machines and the earthworks, that's usually a male dominated space. and. I, there's no need for that. We can bring women into the space. Women are utterly capable. Look at Australia. Women are preferred for those tradey, uh, tradey um, positions because they're more delicate with machines and especially the underground, the underwater, you know, extraction that they're doing and exploration. You have, you need really delicate operation of machinery. Women need to fill the space. Cassie, I hope you're with me. <laughs> Um, but anyway, I have a, also a Facebook group called Permaculture Women and Earthworks. Like, please post your, a picture of yourself in an excavator or whatever. But women, get into the space. Do not be intimidated. Don't be scared. Have the confidence. Let's become carpenters, excavator. I don't drive excavators. I guide the operator. Even better. So... I totally agree 100% and having worked with both, I'll totally agree as well as far as uh, uh, women are less likely to get themselves in trouble on a machine, which can be very dangerous, very scary. It's not a great place for a machismo attitude. Um, so yeah, I know as a whole at Water Stories, we're absolutely with you. And, um, you know, I think you also have touched a lot- And I bet on... insurance companies prefer women to operate big sure. machines. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. And you really touched a bit on, you know, how male dominated also the legal stuff is. And I call it the laws of man, not the laws of humans, because usually women in matriarchal societies decide based on what's going to be in the best long term interest of that place, not the best short term gains and long term consequences. And so yeah. we really need to rewrite these laws of man and disregard <laughs> them and follow the laws of nature, which you know, tend to be aligned with more matriarchal societies as well. Well, okay, just really quickly, if I, so I know a lot of people are going to roll their eyes at this, and in the permaculture movement, there are a lot of, well, we say spermaculture sometimes, right, because of that attitude, but, you know, this is going to be super unpopular. When we talk about toxic masculinity, people go, well, what about toxic femininity? That doesn't exist. Toxic masculinity, why we say that is because the things that men learn about what it means to be masculine is be tough, be competitive, be combative, be aggressive, be exact, you know, things that can harm other people, right? Be harmful. Those can be harmful. Women are taught like, be nice, be congenial, be nurturing. You know, those are the messages that we receive. And so literally there is no toxic masculine femininity. There are toxic women for sure. But the point is, is that that mentality the founding fathers of science, including Bacon, created the masculine birth of time, right? The whole scientific novel about a masculine lens, exactly what you're talking about. The reductionist Cartesian mechanistic thinking about nature as an engine that we can pull apart. Whereas the feminine thinking, and I hate that also, because you know, I'm probably more of a masculine fe female, but um, not that anyone should read into that. Um, <laughs> never gonna get a date again, a heterosexual date, just to clarify. Anyway, um, but... <laughs> Um, you know, but uh, that the, but women and feminine thinking is much more interconnected, interrelated, understanding the systemic, and that's why right now we're shifting towards systemic science, right? Looking at ecology and our living planet. And I'm not a real like kind of too foofy kumbaya person, but Gaia, the whole concept of Gaia is our scientifically is our planet as a living interconnected whole system, is way more aligned with sort of, you know, what you're talking about in terms of feminine long-term thinking. So there's my feminist theory. Cheers. I mean, that's so important. Like the story that you shared, like the cultural difference of you go to these places where the women do all the work and the men are sitting around drinking tea. You know, I, you know, that's the most masochistic thing I can think about. We're like, yeah, that's my wife. She's the slave. She does all the work. And meanwhile, I'm sitting here drinking. And you're like, what, what is the, it's, it's like, what is the cultural difference that, that, um, 
enables men to kind of think like that where they or the, their wife is forced to do all the work. And also, I think it was either you or Warren Brush had the story where in one village, the only thing that got the men in the village to work was when the grandma, like the village elder who was like the grandma, finally picked up a shovel herself and started digging. That was the last straw that like kind of shamed the men into working. Like, ugh, fine, grandma's doing it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the worst, the ultimate for me is when your husband brings home the baby of another baby mama and expects you to raise it or feed it or, you know, anyway. So that does happen, but, and that is not, uh, that is not an African phenomenon that like, welcome to the Milky Way, okay? Um, the United States is listed as the 10th most dangerous country in the world for women, according to US State Department. The number one death among pregnant women in the United States is murdered by a man. So. You know, this is not an African thing. What I want to, it is not a Middle East thing. I want to be really, really clear. You know, I'm sure in Oregon, you got some really juicy communities up there, like the Minutemen and open carry type, I don't know, anti, I came up with a new term, anti-faxer, you know, like anti-facts. Anyway, so, you know, those kind of cultures breed um, male dominance and brutality against women and just oppression of women. And it's, you know, we will never have environmental justice on our planet until we have social, ethic, ethnic, uh, sexual, all the other justices. It's what, there's just one justice. There's only one justice. <laughs> okay, there's only one justice. You can't, if you don't value life, you don't value life. Whether that's a soil organism or, you know, people get really pissed off at me here because we get locusts and they're like, oh, we have a locust invasion. I'm like, can we back the truck up? Locusts have literally been here for 17 million years. There is one invasive species on our planet. It is humans. Like, hello, we are the only, the biggest invasive species in our galaxy, right? Like, how can we not understand that? <laughs> so anyway. And I think there's so much to be gained from a different attitude where you instead teach treat those events and organisms as something to learn from rather than this enemy to be overcome. I even watched this, it was this global summit about, you know, the urgency that we face and they were framing this great war against climate change. And we're never gonna move to a better place with this warring attitude. We need to come at it from a whole different space, really. Well, as a lot of Permies would say, collaboration instead of cooperation, right? Partnership partnership you know and and that takes a lot of like that takes self-work too i mean we all have egos we all have pride but it, it's really i mean I, the common point here is about ethics like where do we want to move i live in africa right now there's a massive movement in my industry about localization kicking people out who are from the global north and making space for the global south that needs to happen it has implications for me for sure but I know I'm never going to disagree with the fact that that's what needs to happen. White people have privilege. We have to understand that and do what we can to ensure that we are trying to dismantle the 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 implications that that has for people. Male have men have privilege. White women like everybody has different privileges. We just need to be aware of them and say, yeah, I do benefit from a system because of this bias because I'm a man or I'm white or I'm a white woman or I'm from this part of the world or I'm wealthy or I have a certain social status or social orienta sexual orientation. So again, you know, real justice environmentally, ecologically is about the value of life and about being outward and about being communal, you know, about empathy and compassion, right? You have to, we have to see each other in our humanity in our full humanity and see that yeah we're all part of the same organism it's this story of separation that we are our own entity on our yeah. you know us against the world when in actuality we're all part of a much bigger organism that is working collectively whether individually we're working collectively or not when i was a little girl living in cyprus somebody told me the story about a wave who was so upset he was a little jumping wave in the ocean he was happy rolling around and then he saw what was about to happen like the beach was getting closer and closer and all of his friends were just crashing against the beach he was crying and was like stop he was trying to tell everybody stop stop don't go any further don't you see what's about to happen and they looked at him like dude like you don't get it you're not a wave you're part of the ocean <laughs> anyway nice. when i was, I was like, like different, um, <laughs> 
So um, one question from Michael, and we don't want to keep you for too long. We're going to have to wrap this up at some point here, Natalie. So uh, yeah, um, we do have a few more questions though, if you're game. Yeah, yeah. Um, one question from Michael, any good resources for a new building code templates? Oh, well, okay. So, um, you know, Siggy Coco, who I mentioned, S-I-G-I-K-O-K-O, -K -O, she does, she's an architect, she's a chemist, she's US-based, she's an incredible resource, she has an amazing website, but one thing that she really um, pounded into us, into the, um, in the courses I've taken with her is the people who work for building codes, and don't forget I'm an urban planner, originally, um, no, K-O-K-O, -K -O. but anyway, yeah, same website, K-O-K-O. -K -O. Um, you know, people who work for building codes and everything, and um, they're, they are human beings, right? They have a goal, they have an objective, but if you can explain why, how the structures we want to make meet the goals that they have, first, you know, they need to make sure that we were building safely and soundly and no one's going to be put at risk. And so she provides a great guidance, and I'm sure she's got some, um, you know, resources on the website of how to work with your local building code regulators to ensure that their concerns are met through the design and installation <coughs> of your project. So, it, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> it is very possible people all over, you know, that is the original way of people building, right? Like the whole world lives in cob, cob houses or earthen structures. And so, our goal now is to try to return to understanding why they built in a bioregion the way they did. How can we integrate the production of materials in a regenerative way? Um, but I'm so sick of us not building with natural in natural ways. I, I can't deal with it. Like I want everyone to live in a thermal mass home that is nice and cool on the inside when it's hot outside with no costs, right? They've got us really by the nose hairs, you know, with uh, interior climate control. You have to pay out of the nose to heat your home, pay out of the nose to cool your home. We are at war with stupidity, as Dr. Shiva says. Stop it. Everybody get your counter shock doctrine in place, daydream, get on Pinterest, you know, uh, whatever you need to do, but we've got to move in that direction. So it's possible all over the country, all over the world. I don't have the resources at hand, but definitely Siggy has. What is Wafati's so probably a building stuff. type? Uh, that was um, Paul's building method, or was that actually was the Wafati? Uh, we could talk about Wafati's. Uh, yeah, let's not dive uh, off that cliff. I, I think um, there was one person that really wanted to talk live. I think I think we've had a good job answering a lot of the questions out of here. So thanks everybody for answering it. Uh, Danielle wanted to speak live, so I'm just gonna let her. She's been had her quite hand up like constantly like da, da, da. Uh -huh. so if you're if you're around Danny I'm gonna let you chat for like a little bit here so I'm gonna allow you to talk if you if you're down to talk if not no worries and we'll just conclude it up how you doing Hi. great thank you guys so much for doing this it's been really fantastic I meant to do that for like a question I I, I realized you guys were doing the circle questions but my question was like other than the obvious ways that you've helped the women in Africa, um, do you think that like your presence and your attitude really made a difference in men's attitudes of their women as a resource? And how, I mean, I'm just so proud of you for that. So thank you because. <laughs> um, well, I'm 45 and single, so no. Um, <laughs> um, no, I mean, it is like, you know, I, I, I have a vision. I feel very passionate. I'm only a forward thinking person, you know? I feel like, anyway, and and yeah, I can be perceived as outward and extroverted. Um, and so that can have benefits and it can have disadvantages for sure. Um, but I don't think that that's a specifically African thing. I think that's a human thing. And, you know, um, <sighs> You know, when I was country director in South Sudan in a war zone, I had a young woman who joined our team and I just basically told her, you have to sharpen your instincts because in a nanosecond, you have to figure out if you have to be sweet as pie, if you're faced with a bunch of drunk men with AK-47s, you have to figure out at that moment, I've got two roads I can go down. Do I be sweet as pie or do I just be an absolute witch right now and just put my foot down and be like, I'm the one in charge. So um, yeah, I mean, 
uh, I think anyone who travels and finds himself in a new context you know, will come up against trying to understand how they're perceived. But I've been in this context for a long time, almost two decades, 17 years in East Africa. And um, I'm sure I pissed some people off, you know, mostly men. Um, I'm okay with that. Um, I think a lot of things about our world need to change, including, including harmful gendered norms. I'm outspoken about what I feel about it. I've never been so outspoken as I have in this webinar, to be honest, because for the for the first time in a long time, I'm independent and I'm not pegged to an agency. But um, yeah, I, I don't think that people should hold back. I think we're in a time right now of transition. Like, what are we wasting time for? You know, if you're a professional and you're worried, oh, my boss or my company or my president of my, I don't know what, like, ain't nobody got time for that like we just we have to say what must be said we have to do what must be done and 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 it is harder for people to swallow it often if if, if it's coming from a woman because women are expected to be more deferential more soft-spoken more you know compromising and yeah that's i'm i'm actually a geneticist so i would uh, have to say that having the polish uh I'm also of Polish descent, so I can appreciate your outspoken um, attitude and, and, and keen insight to know when to pull back. So thank you. Thank you again. I'm not saying I've perfected knowing when, or <laughs> when to pull back or when not to, but I think it's important to practice. <laughs> done good Thanks so far. Thanks thank a you. lot. Take care. Thanks, Danielle. All right. Well, I think we've been at it for about two and a half hours now. Man, this has been an awesome, awesome session. Like, I think like it's it's fun to run. It's not just about land design. It's like you bringing justice back to people and like just the decency of like I'm a human being. I I want to reclaim basic justice of my life and going beyond just the water capture, but, you know, saving someone's life is, is incredible. So thank you for sharing the journey of, of how you've helped these villages do that. And, you know, what you've done, Warren Brush, and it's, I, I really hope that we'll tell more stories like that. And that's what we're trying to do a, a water story. So I really appreciate this and everyone who's been a part of this. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for donating your, your morning to hear Natalie's story and, all these stories that we're going to share and everyone's getting the replay after this. And I, I hope you stick around and, and really continue this journey that you're on, whether you're a community activist, whether you're trying to be a practical professional doing this water work, whether you own a piece of land and want to make it a paradise, doesn't matter where you're at, you can make a difference. And I hope mm -hmm. like, like Natalie said, like when, when the emergencies happen, you're ready to move and you, you have a plan to make a big difference here. So, and Raleigh, I just want to end by saying that, like, for, there are more, there are more solutions than problems. Yeah, and it's fun and it's exciting and it's good news. So, like, put your mind and your energy there. And as Warren says, you know, put your life's energy into life affirming endeavors. Don't. Yes, there's bad stuff happening. Yes, bad news. Yes, bad. You know, don't protest. Who was it? Mer Mother Teresa, you know, that Saint Mer Teresa, don't ever invite me to an anti-war rally. I will never go to an anti-war rally. Invite me to a peace rally, you know? So that's the difference. We know bad things are happening. We're on our way out. Be part of the good story. So that was just what I wanted to say. And then lastly, is there any chance of getting a copy of the chats? I wasn't able to engage at all. Oh yeah, with yeah, I'm, I'm uh, saving this right here. I'll send it to you right after, but yeah, you'll get the chats. It'll it'll be great, and yeah, ever we'll follow up with everybody after this in the replay, and yeah, we'll keep this interaction going. It was fun seeing people on Circle, but I know we're going to build a bigger community of, of people that support each other who are doing a lot of the work, and it's going to be really exciting building that. So, I, I Natalie, hope you're going to be a, a part of that and lend your insights. That'll be great. Absolutely. Thanks so much for the opportunity. And thanks everyone who stayed around for hours and hours. <laughs> uh, and thanks so much for coming on, speaking truthfully, speaking honestly. I mean, you painted the picture so clearly. And I think that's so important. We have 
so much bad news, but when you can very clearly show, here's what we did and here's what it looked like X months later. Yeah, that just paints the picture clear as day for anybody. So thank you for bringing that to the table. We really appreciate it. It's been an honor and pleasure to have you on here. Likewise, yeah. and thank you guys, Cassie, Zach, and, and Raleigh for, you know, for doing this, for putting your energy to like trying to highlight and connect everybody. So that's so important and really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. You got it. All right, buddy. All right. We'll have a great day. Chat soon. Peace. All right. Sleep Good well, day. Bye. Bye.